Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to Know Your Gear podcast episode 321. I hope everybody had a great week and uh let's uh let's just get into it. Let's uh let's see what's going on. We have some questions from last week that I didn't get answered. Uh the moderators uh, sent me some uh super chats I missed, so we'll make sure we scoop some of those up. I have a couple of the uh super geeky people that come a little early and leave a question or two or a subject and we'll hit those as well. And uh of course, if you're trying to get uh you know, like if you're putting a question towards me, put the question marks at the beginning and that way I know that uh, it's to me and you're not just chatting amongst yourselves. And uh <laughs> Beast Ridge 581 says, "Hello, Phil, broadcasting from the surface of the sun. It's it's warm. <laughs> it's warm. Welcome to the desert. It's Arizona and it's hot." So uh so there you go. Hey, but the, you know, what are you gonna do? That's the that's the price you pay for the great weather the rest of the year, I think. Okay, so uh, uh, what do we got? Let's get into stuff. Um, oh, so somebody says Benjamin says Guitar Center is now selling Sir guitars. That's interesting. I would never have predicted that in a million years. So if that's something that just recently happened, that's pretty cool. Is it on their website? Let's take a look. I would be. I don't know why I am shocked by that. Now, I wouldn't be shocked if select guitar centers were to start carrying the Sir guitar line. I'm just on their main website. I would really be shocked uh, if the Sir line is on the main site. And the only Sir gear I see on their website is used gear. But I wouldn't be... Uh, but it's possible, yeah, that Sir is at like select guitar centers. That's how it used to be with Mesa Boogie. When Guitar Center was Mesa Boogie dealer, it was only certain stores. They have like... They have basically a tier system on their stores. And so some stores are more of, I don't want to say flagship, but they carry higher end brands uh, than some of the other stores. So interesting enough. Um, the, uh, I, like I said, really shocking to hear that. It, but I, you know, then I also, I'm not shocked to hear that, right? Um, it's, uh, let's face it, the market is soft. I think it's uh, official now. Uh, can I call that? Can I be the official guy on the internet that says the market is now soft on guitars? Let's go ahead and do that. Um, because why? Well, there's a couple of things. Um, as you guys know, when I was at Sweetwater for Gear Fest, there was a lot happening in two weeks. Obviously, I was on the East Coast. I was like New York, New Jersey, you name it. I was Washington, D.C., uh, Maryland, <laughs> you know. And um, and then I came back and I've, you know, been trying to get back in the swing of things. Last week's show was the first real show back, you know. And so there was some subjects I didn't get to talk about. And this might tie into that. Um, what I noticed when I was there, I went to a ton of music stores on the East Coast, and that's really important to me because I've been to a ton of music stores on the West Coast. So when you go to music stores around, you know, you kind of look to see what's the vibe. And sometimes you can't tell what is just happening in your community, your area. So, for instance, if I was to start telling you what five stores in Arizona were like, that doesn't really tell you anything. Um, and then if I was to say, OK, I went to a, you know, half a dozen stores in California, maybe the, the coincidence is there are more of a West Coast thing, but still there. Um, so things I saw, here's what I saw. I saw stores willing to deal. In fact, they did deal, a willing deal. So that was, um, and that's not new, obviously, but there was a time where it was like, yeah, I don't know if you don't get this, it's, you know, it's too late. So definitely uh, a very consistent willingness to deal and more, uh, more importantly, a willingness to just offer deals. You know, like, hey, we can cut you a deal on that. Uh, that was very consistent everywhere I went. The other thing that was super consistent was um, a lot of stores that did high-end stores seem to have a lot, in my opinion, a lot of Gibson Custom Shop and Fender Custom Shop guitars. I mean, it was a crazy amount of guitars in those stores. Um, they, I think, uh, and actually, to, so you know, I'm not guessing, when talking to employees and managers, managers at different stores, uh, they said that they were very excited to have all this product in stock because they haven't had it in a while. Um, and no one seemed like it was like, oh, it's so horrible. There's so many expensive guitars. But it was really kind of like they were excited about it. But also, you know, it's a lot of guitars to move. The uh, consistency also with all the stores was none of the stores seemed to have any, in fact, none. How about this? None of the Paul Reed Smith dealers I went to, which was about four or five on the on the East Coast, um, and they were very consistent with dealers I've, I've seen on the West Coast, where none of the Paul Reed Smith dealers had any core guitars, none. And they all said that they're still waiting um, 16 months, 18 months, two years for core guitars. 
and that once they arrive, they're pretty much pre-sold or, you know, they got one in stock and it kind of sells quickly. Um, they all, and I mean all, every store, uh, lower tier, mid tier, higher tier stores, guitar centers, you name it, everybody was shockingly, to me at least, full of SEs. I mean, it was an insane amount of SEs in every store. Um, it actually started making me nervous <laughs> how many SEs I saw. Um, and uh, I was like, okay, but that could be because a lot of the orders of the SEs that were put in by dealers didn't really land until the last minute until the market kind of started, you know, going the other way. And, uh, you know, the, the peak, so to speak, right? Like I said, I, I stay away from the term of like, you know, a bad term because remember, we were at a boom. So of course the boom had to end. So let's start there. Whether or not this is a, uh, you know, a point where people aren't going to be buying guitars and it's going to really slow down. I, I haven't seen that yet because they're still selling tons of guitars. They're just not selling anywhere close to where they were during the boom. But it's also the type of guitars. So lots of SEs uh, everywhere and very few S2s. So some, most of the dealers said the same thing. They couldn't get S2s in stock, but, um, but SEs were uh, uh, abundant. So I would, I say that to you since, you know, this is a small community here or, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it is. Um, if you're in the market for an SE, man, check those dealers out. I bet you they would be willing to give you uh, some, some, some kind of assistance, a deal, right? Hook you up, maybe throw in something, maybe take, take care of you, an extra setup, whatever. Um, especially since one thing I've known and obviously like 13 years owning a music store and now, you know, I've been out, removed from it for about seven years. And now when I travel, I have that kind of experience to see both sides of the counter and see how it kind of works from both sides. What I can tell you is I would be really shocked if those dealers were aware of what I was telling you right now, because a lot of dealers stay very isolated to themselves. It's not very, um, it's not a, they're not super communicative, uh, communicative to other dealers, right? It's not really common. Now, some dealer is probably going to put in a comment in the video, like, oh, I talked to all the dealers around the town too. I did too as well, but I'm just saying everybody kind of knows the dealers aren't really, uh, talking to each other. And so you guys don't misunderstand what I'm saying. It's because they don't have time, <laughs> right? When you, right? When you work in retail, you're, you're pretty much any minute you're not at that retail environment you you know we're trying to spend some time with family or friends or loved ones so um so anyways uh like i said i would imagine a lot of them don't realize how they all have duplicate stock and lots of it across the board so uh don't uh don't just eagerly buy any SEs right now full boat now that being said to this to the original part of this question um the market is definitely soft because i have recently purchased a couple guitars and I, and I hate to say it, it was all for the same way. I saw a, I saw an amazing deal. And then I thought, God, that's a really good deal. And then I thought, I wonder how low this deal could go. And I threw offers and every offer got taken. Um, which is like why you're looking at behind me, a beautiful nags. I think somebody asked me if I still have my nags. I do still have my nags. Now I have two nags. <laughs> this is a not nags, uh, sovereign X. Um, it's tier one is the most expensive tier you can get. It's absolutely beautiful. I'm not going to grab it off the wall and show you because I think I want to do a deep dive on this guitar uh, more so than even the other nags, but that'll get done too. Um, but uh, man, crazy expensive guitar, but just to, just to tell you, uh, $2,900 off. <laughs> uh, I'm laughing because I'm like I said, I'm really appreciative of, of the person who gave me the deal. It was fantastic. In fact, if they didn't give me the deal, I would have never pulled the trigger. Um, but at that point, as you guys know, obviously I'm friends with Larry Mitchell. He's uh, got a signature guitar that's based on the Sovereign. Uh, and I've, I've played with him many times. I've always wanted a Sovereign. I had one and I didn't like the eight and a half, was it eight and a half radius on it. It just wasn't vibing with me. And uh, two things have happened to me I, I, uh, that that really kind of came to kind of mar married up on this guitar. One, this had a 14 inch radius fretboard. I'm not a huge. Uh, it doesn't matter. I like 12 inch radius, but 14s, you know, what's which what's, what's two inches between friends? <laughs> Anyways, 14 inch uh, radius, which is fine. I was looking for 12. So 12 and 14 is fine for me. And it also has EVO or EVO gold frets which I have now fallen in love with. Uh, since Kiesel sent this guitar, um, which has Evo gold frets, I don't know why, but I, there is no fret that I love more. So um, 
the uh, I love Evo Gold Rats. I don't know what it is. I cannot put my uh, my I can put my fingers on it. I just can't p finger like kind of point where it is that I'm falling in love with those frats so much. But absolutely love those. If I could literally have every guitar with them, I would. I don't know why. You know, I'm, I mean, I have some theories, but I just love them. And so I'm really happy about that. But again, it's not so much to talk about this new guitar day. Something for me, it's really to talk about the market. Um, I also um, acquired an amp this week uh, for the same reason. It was just somebody throwing out crazy deals, right? Um, they had it at a great deal. I thought, wow, that's a great deal. And then again, like some of you are probably going, wow, I wonder how soft the market is. And I threw an even lower offer at it. And um, and in fact, I would tell you right now, you know, a couple circumstances in all circumstances. So please don't blindly jump into this. But I would caution a lot of you right now, if you're in the market for some gear and you're thinking about throwing a, an offer to see how motivated the seller is, um, I would be 90% uh, prepared to be ready to pay because they probably gonna take that offer. I have not seen, um, I have not seen uh, a, a lot of offers being turned down right now. In fact, I can't even, uh, I don't know about you guys on Reverb, I can't even watch any products anymore because every product I watch out of curiosity to like, maybe I'm thinking about it, maybe I'm just curious about something. Dude, everything I watch, get I get an offer. It's like 100% I'm getting an offer within 24 hours to, hey, this is... In fact, I'm getting the weird thing. I'm getting offers on things I don't even remember watching. And I look and I'm, they're not on my watch list. I'm just getting offers for them. And I think it's because maybe I searched them once before. I was I looked at them before. Or maybe I had watched them previously and unwatched them. I'm not sure. Um, but I'm getting tons of offers. So definitely the... Definitely is not the time to just willy-nilly click and buy right now. I would definitely see what's out there in the deal market. And then that segues into a, uh, one of the early questions, or maybe it was a question for last week. I'm a little, I have them all pasted here, so I understand some of these are gonna be super chats from last week. I missed some of these are early ri riser questions. questions. Um, and it was uh, Kelly B. So I'm pretty sure this was from last week. Kelly B said, hey, new guitar day. It doesn't matter what I got today. But without your advice, I'd be still doing online instead of making deals with mom and pops. And uh, thanks, Phil, and to all you at the KYG community. That's great news. Like I said, I've always said this before, you know, it, the internet is about convenience and variety. I mean, anything you want and as fast as you want it, that's why I love the internet. And that's why I like Sweetwater and I like online dealers like crazy and, you know, every, every from Flipside Music to you know, Wild West guitars and, you know, Eddie's guitars, anywhere else I'm purchasing from, you know, a ton of stores. However, uh, American Musical Supply, I'm trying to think of everybody I purchased from online. However, like I said, if you really want the best deal or the best service, it's always going to be with, done with a real handshake in person. And uh, some people will have different opinions about that. But me, I'm just telling you what happened personally to me. And I've given this advice, obviously, to Kelly B. It worked for the, them as well. It's happened a lot in the past, which is there's just something about the human con uh, connection. People take care of people. It's just how it works. So when you're just a, you know, <laughs> an email or a click or something on the internet, you're never going to get that same interaction, same deal. And so it's not even just like a emotional connection. It's a financial thing, right? The dealers will take care of you. So, um, so, uh, anyways, the, uh, that's uh, so I'm, gl I'm glad that it worked out for you. And of course, I love it when you guys remind me of stuff like that, that it's working for you. It reminds me to remind or tell everybody again, see if it works for the next person. Like I said, don't be afraid to go out there, especially now. I think a lot of mom and pops I saw were were a little thick on the inventory. So, you know, if you're if you're watching this channel on a Friday, you probably have the sickness pretty bad like I do. And, uh, you know, there's always a new piece of gear or a new album to get or some new music that I got to consume. And uh, like I said, don't forget to spread that that lovely cash to the mom and pops because not only do they probably well they probably need it but also uh, you'll you'll benefit from it. So it's not like I'm I'm like giving charity to mom and pops. I think you'll benefit from it probably as not much if not much as much or more than them. So don't forget that. Like I said, um, one downfall I've said this before and I like it when you guys cue me back in is look I'm gonna promote Sweetwater constantly because it's talked about so much on the internet and of course there's affiliate links and there's drivers for channels like me to kind of mention them sometimes. Cause if you know, if you click the link down below, whatever you buy, which I, you know, you, I get a piece of, and I've said before, please 
Don't click the link down below before. <laughs> no. uh, call them up and get a deal. That's for 10% off. Get 10% in your pocket. They don't give me 10%. I'd rather you get 10% than me just get a few percent. Um, but those links, obviously, if you're just going to click something blindly like strings or something and buy something, and, and you know, might as well give the channel a little donation that doesn't hurt you. Um, but um, it does take attention away from mom and pops. And as I've always said, you know, the mom and pops are where you're going to find the deals, where you're going to find the relationships, the compassion and, and, and in all fairness, so I don't sound a little crass. I don't want to say it's crass, but I'm, I feel a little like I'm, you know, the, the thing about Sweetwater, I will tell you as a big company, Sweetwater is the most mom and pop feeling company I've ever dealt with that of that kind of nature. So there you go. So, all right, let's get back uh shiznit i'm gonna say that's what it is that's uh isn't that uh isn't that um uh, from uh uh little mickey is that what it is it's like adam sandler and he's like this is the shiznit is that what that's from if i got it right uh that's awesome if not that's what i thought it was the the, the devil the demons right they were eating con uh i thought it was popeye's chicken right popeye's chicken chicken is the shiznit anyways uh shiznit says is that a heritage new yes that is a brand new heritage right there. It is an amazing guitar, and uh, I will be doing a deep dive. It is a sponsored content video. In other words, Heritage made the guitar for me and sent it to me. Um, they sent a bunch. I, I get in that vibes, you know. I've seen a couple of YouTubers going, I got a Heritage. So I think Heritage did the rounds and reached out to some channels, you know what I mean, to get their guitars out there. And uh, I'm glad they did because, you know, I've, I've, you know, we've talked about heritage many times on the channel and how I've tried to buy one and how it didn't work out and all this stuff. And, and, um, but I, I want to share just this one thing before the deep dive comes out, which I will share in the deep dive, but just, so you know, this is not just a heritage guitar. This is a custom made for me heritage guitar with my specific specifications. And, uh, they did that for me and Tim Pierce, which is just something I want to just kind of like you're right, you know, right, elbow in like, yeah, me and Tim Pierce. Cause you know, when you think <laughs> amazing studio artist like Tim Pierce, you think some dude in his bedroom talking on the internet. Anyways, that's me, right? So just, but anyways, I'm on that level now. Me and Tim Pierce, we got matching. Uh, uh, actually, I don't know if they're matching. I think they are. Cause uh, like I said, all I really know is that when I, I ordered what I ordered, they said, that's what Tim Pierce ordered. I said, really? <laughs> they said, oh, that makes sense. Um, uh, so I'll be sharing that with you guys uh, a little bit exciting. Like I said, it's very exciting. It It is uh, not a, uh, um, so you guys know, because sometimes like, you know, these stories are not going to come out in videos. Uh, I don't know if this particularly will come out in the video. I don't know if it's relevant to the review, but it might be interesting for you guys to know. Um, not only did Heritage reach out to me and say, hey, we'd like to get you a guitar in your hands. And I said, okay. And they said, um, and I'm just going to, again, being very upfront with you guys, what was said in the discussion, what I told them was, if you want to send a guitar for a deep dive, send the guitar for the deep dive. That's fine. All right, right. Whether you believe it or not, I don't really care. And, uh, you know, right. That's okay. I said, however, if you're saying like, you know, cause they were saying things like, we like your channel. We'd like you to have the guitar. We'd like you to enjoy the guitar. And I said, if you want me to do a deep dive, we'll do that. If you want me to keep the guitar, beat my Gibson R9. And I told them the issues I had with my Gibson R9, and uh, which a lot of you are probably going to guess. <laughs> and I said, I don't really need a wall with a Gibson R9 and a Heritage, you know, guitar. You know, uh, I don't need two high-end, custom shoppy, 59-esque like style Les Pauls. I go, I just, I don't, you know, I don't have, I don't have room for that in uh, in my house. And and uh, plus, I, you know, it just doesn't make sense to me. So um, I won't tell you guys yet what will happen. Um, it'll be disclosed in the video, what ended up happening. But basically the goal was, um, or the end result is, even though they're giving me the guitar for, I say free, but keep in mind, a lot of times the term free is used loosely in YouTube in exchange for content, right? Sometimes people go, oh, they send you free stuff. No one sends you free stuff. They ex send you stuff in exchange for you doing video content. And uh, it's no different than if I was a plumber and they said, I'll give you a guitar if you you know, fix our toilets. The only difference is apparently in this analogy, I sell a ton of guitars, like, you know, right. Instead of just fix the toilet. Um, but, uh, I told them that I was not interested in doing the video, you know, as a, this is my guitar kind of video. If it wasn't a, I replaced my Gibson with this. So they had to blow me away. 
because I, I, I told them I would get rid of my Gibson if it was amazing. So the question is, is it amazing enough to get rid of my Gibson? We'll see. I'll show you in the video. Some of you guys probably already figured it out, but it doesn't matter. If, I'll leave you in suspense. When the video comes out, I'll explain what, what I like better and why, and not just a, hey, you know, <laughs> they gave me a guitar and this company didn't, and I bought that, so I'm keeping the one they gave me. I had nothing to do with this because again, it's, it's, uh, it's which one is what, which one is, which one do I prefer and why not? Which one is better? Which one is, do I prefer and why? And of course this one's a little, I guess, what does it say? Loaded? What do you, what do you say that it's, it's, it's a little on the, uh, I guess loaded is the way, right? Like obviously Gibson didn't make that R9 specifically for me. So obviously heritage already has the edge of fitting my things. So uh so there you go that there you go um we'll share that but that's that's what's going on with that i'm pretty excited about it the only thing i wasn't excited about was it literally arrived right before i left for two weeks <laughs> joe joe wants to know what i had for lunch today uh i didn't have lunch today i had breakfast um so we had breakfast we went and had breakfast um, Brian says it's lightweight. We know that. Yeah, but wait, you see how light it is. It's crazy. We need to get back to the next question. Next question is, uh, Matthew wants to, says, Hey, Phil, it's easy to find reasons to buy a new electric guitar, different pickups, body, etc. Uh, but can you think of a good excuse to get a new acoustic? Absolutely. I think actually a new acoustic is easier than an electric guitar. I think a new electric guitar is uh, a lot of that is uh, a lot of crap, right? Um, there are very few, uh, musicians. I'll tell you a, a missing element in a storyline, right? When we think of touring musicians, when we think of studio musicians, and when we think of gigging, working gigging musicians, when I say working gigging, I mean like wedding bands, you know, people who are literally, uh, not just playing their own music, you know, at, at, at a bar or a club or a show and trying to make it to be rock stars. We're talking about people who are literally paid to entertain uh, people, maybe they play covers, whatever they do, but they're doing it um, for the sole purpose of that's all they get out of it is they make money from it, right? There's no like, one day we'll get discovered playing, you know, uh, this cover. And so when you look at those three musicians, which I've interviewed a lot of, and I've also repaired a ton of their guitars, uh, you know, all, all kinds of musicians. And and I can actually say a lot of them are my friends, and that's maybe even more important than you know just actually having those business type relationships with them. Um, what's missing from all of them is they don't seem to ever say like this. I use this guitar for this sound. I use this guitar for this gig. I use this guitar for this thing. It's very rare that that happens. Usually they just have like this is my go to, and it can do everything, and then this is my backup. And this is how I get to, and it's a lot of like, you know, a fake it kind of attitude, right? Like this is how I fake a Strat style tone when I have this guitar. This guitar is how I fake, you know, uh, this, or here's how I restring something to make it be like a baritone or something. And so why I say that is a lot of times when we justify guitars, like, oh, I'm going to have a Les Paul style guitar, and then I'm going to have a Strat style guitar. I don't know why I'm pointing the way I am, but there's a Strat and LP style guitar behind me. You know, it's like, those are your two tones. And then you have a telly style guitar and then you need a hollow body. This is something that a lot of hobbyist musicians, we focus on this, right? It's because we're excited. And, and so, you know, I'm not saying anybody's excluded from it, but I mean, we tend to be the biggest chunk of this ideology, this idea like I got to have one of everything, right? Um, in fact, most gigging musicians I know have duplicates of the same. It's about consistency for them. This is the guitar they play. And then this is like, in case that one breaks a string. And then this is one's because the first one's starting to wear out and like they find what they find. Right. And they use it. And it's uh, this, this idea that they have this ever ending uh, like wall or racks of different guitars. Um, and you can see that when you see go on YouTube channels, if you look at you know, the channels that are studio musicians, so uh, more so they have less diverse amount of guitars than let's say the, gear review channels, right? which are gear review channels tend to all come from the same uh, lineage, which is uh, a gear enthusiast, right? That's what makes you want to make content every week about all your guitars. It's like, you know, um, and the reason I say that is uh, I actually think that we kind of convince ourselves we need all these different kind of guitars and it's not based on any kind of real, real factual logic. It's just 
you know, hey, you got the money, you love music, you love guitars, and you buy guitars. Like I said, there's other things you can buy, and I think these are better. Like I told you, if I was uh, worth millions of dollars, I wouldn't buy a Rolex, I'd buy guitars. It's like, I, I wouldn't change anything. Uh, you know, if uh, I wouldn't buy a, a Ferrari, which is my, right? I, I don't, I can't imagine uh, ever wanting anything other than guitars. I'm just into guitars. So that being said, to your question, I think your question about, you know, getting an excuse for acoustic is much easier for me. And it's not because I think you need same logic, like, oh, here you have a parlor acoustic, you have a grand auditorium, you have a dreadnought, right? You have a classical. I don't think like that. Um, acoustics are truly different, right? <laughs> right. Um, one, uh, one ironic thing that I've always done that's kind of made me laugh over the years and I'm as guilty as everyone else. So I don't mind poking fun at somebody that I'm, especially when I'm as guilty as you, um, when you repair guitars, when you set up guitars, you find most players are, con are like, Hey, I got a Les Paul. I always play a Strat. Can you make it play basically like a Strat? And also, can you uh, get it to sound a little brighter, <laughs> right? And and I'm using it as a generic uh, kind of story, but it happens a lot. Like a lot of players want you to make all their guitars be the same. And so that's why I sometimes joke about the fact that it's, they all just, it's different shapes of guitars. This is all like, you know, how do I make all these guitars sound and play the same, but look different? And acoustics are, are to me, are truly different. You know, uh, two dreadnoughts, even specked out by the same, you know, woods built by different manufacturers can have vastly different feelings and, and tones. So I think, uh, you don't need an excuse to try and well, you, to get a new acoustic, you know, you have to come up with your own reason for that, but to try a new acoustic for the idea of getting a new acoustic, um, I, I find I have uh, some acoustics that I absolutely love. I, I mean, I love, and I can't think of wanting anything else better than them. But yet I'll sometimes pick up an acoustic and it's just so does something that the other acoustic doesn't do in such a brilliant, beautiful way. You know what I mean? Maybe it's a little softer toned. Maybe it's a little, you know, thumps a little differently. There's something about it. Also, I find that uh, as someone who plays, you know, electric guitar, bass and acoustic guitar, you know, like a lot of you do, um, I find that I spend a lot of time on acoustic guitar actually writing music or practicing. <laughs> <laughs> so acoustic guitar, there's something about having a couple of different acoustic guitars and not so much the collection of having guitars. Um, like, let me put it this way. If somebody came over right now and I was going to play a little show and tell and like, oh, look at my new nags. And this is a, you know, this is a Framus and whatever. Right. And this is an Ingve Malmsteen Strat. Right. What if I was going to show a friend who was into guitars that I never, never, ever show them my acoustics. There's nothing about them that's interesting to, but I don't know why there's nothing interesting, but there isn't for me. Um, but the acoustic guitars is where the real, the real magic is happening. That's where the real music is being played. I'm really doing stuff on them. I very rarely um, pick up an acoustic and just, you know, don't do anything with it. It literally music comes out of me in some way, whether that's just new creativeness or grading new music or it's, or, or practicing something I've never done before. There's just something about it. So and I, and I'm always shocked by the way. So you guys know, I'm always shocked by how many guitar players, especially that watch channels like this one, um, that have 10, 20 electric guitars and no acoustics. And I'm like, how could you not? And they go, I don't, I don't like acoustics. And I'm like, you need an acoustic. <laughs> so, so I, I always tell everybody, everybody needs an acoustic guitar. Um, there's a reason why, um, every, I don't want to say every, it sounds too generic, broader strokes. Like I said, too broad. There's a reason why so many famous guitar players that are songwriters tell you all the time in interviews, oh, I wrote that on acoustic, right? Even like, like I said, Kickstart My Heart, Kickstart My Heart by Motley Crue, Mick Mars wrote that riff on acoustic guitar, right? I only use that because it just came to reference, but there's tons of things like that. Metallica has said that too, like wrote this heavy song on acoustic, right? It's just because it doesn't matter. It just comes, you know, it perfectly comes out. Um, so you know, there you go. Um, I have that Inya little acoustic guitar downstairs and I constantly can't help pick it up. And whenever I do, it's just like, I'm, I'm just playing all kinds of actual songs. <laughs> Real music comes out of that thing. Um, it's kind of like vibes, like a toy, but it literally, the mu the real music is where that's coming from. So that's your excuse to get another acoustic guitar is 
um, find something that inspires you, you'll find it. It'll come right out of you. That's what's great. I actually, I love buying guitars. Who doesn't, you know, and having, you know, guitars and trying guitars and even flipping them sometimes, you know, and getting something else. However, if you haven't experienced it, I, I highly recommend you do it at least once in your lifetime. There are tons of music stores across the country. And if you live in other countries, they have them in other countries too that do high end. Like we have acoustic vibes here in uh, Arizona that do high end acoustics and all kinds of beauty. They just have a beautiful acoustic room, right? Anytime. If you can ever have a moment where you walk in, even at a guitar center in the acoustic room, just go in there on a, a slow day and pick up, you know, just commit to six, you know, half a dozen acoustics, six acoustic, acoustics, pick them up and play. And I find that is so enjoyable to, to actually use my ears, and just hear and feel a guitar and, you know, and all of a sudden go, wow, I never, never thought I, you know, that, that feeling or that sound would be something that would inspire me to do something. But there you go. There you go. So the answer is get an acoustic. <laughs> this is the longest answer to get, to just tell you, yeah, you, you don't need an excuse. Just buy an acoustic. Okay. Um, speaking of acoustics, uh, this was a question last week. It says, new guitar day tomorrow, PRS T40E acoustic. I think I reviewed the T50. Uh, it says, have you had any experience with this acoustic from PRS uh, guitars? Uh, yes, I, I really like them. The neck's a little chunky, but I like it. I like the PRS acoustic guitars. I would put them up there as some of my favorite import style acoustics um, when it comes... For acoustic guitars, for me, there's definitely, you have to have this line, unfortunately, and for me, that says these are the import acoustics and these are like the traditional American-made instruments, uh, USA-made guitars. And um, and I'm not talking about collectability. That's, electric guitars, to me, it's mostly about collectability. You buy USA guitars because it's a collectability thing, right? Sometimes, yeah, you can argue there's some better fit and finish, but that is so little and not really valid anymore in today's market. But acoustic-wise, oh, man. Uh, USA made Martins, Gibsons, and Taylors, and Breedloves. You know, they do all vibe totally different than a lot of the import guitars. But that's not meaning they're better. It just means they're, like I said, there's a line to me, and there's certain things I like about import acoustics, which I have, and, uh, you know, kind of the more expensive, traditionally made, USA made guitars. Um, but I would say PRS is in my uh, category of, like, the import ones I love. Obviously, I, I love Yamaha acoustics. I love uh, the PRS ones. I like... The Orange Wood Acoustics, one of my favorite guitars right now. Not absolute favorite guitar, but it's one of my top like five acoustic guitars that I have that I play a lot of it is an Orange Wood that I really, really like. Um, and again, it, I would love to tell you it's the brand or it's this. I, I don't know what it is. It's specifically just that guitar. Like I said, I had the moment with it. We liked each other. <laughs> we said, let's continue this. <laughs> and now we play music together. So... Uh, Matt says he loves his Martin D15. Uh, right, exactly. You know, right? Uh, uh, the D15 is a great guitar. Damn. Okay, so. Okay, John Plunkett says, Hey, Phil, what do you think about the lack of qualified guitar techs? I'm paying $95 for a setup, and there is maybe three respected techs in 100 miles. Massachusetts, any thoughts? Um, you know, it's funny. That was a really interesting conversation I had off the podcast recently about how much the rates have gone up. You know, I like everything. The prices have gone up so much, but repair rates have gone up so much. You know, um, we actually were, uh, actually joking about it. Uh, uh my wife and I were joking about the fact that when I started making YouTube videos, obviously I was a full-time repair person. And one of the things that would happen, we would chuckle, like awkwardly chuckle, <laughs> is I'd make a video and I'd be like, I did a full setup or repair in the video and showed people and it would get like 70,000 views. And then we look at what YouTube paid us and it was less than what I would charge somebody to do that. And then I'd go, yeah, that was, <laughs> then see, that's the laugh. We would go, we're like, yeah, yeah. Um, and so we were like, wow, I, I make less teaching people how to do this than to do it. And you know, right. It's kind of weird. And then obviously over time, you know, the YouTube channel grew and as it grew, it's not the views grow, but obviously the way the ads work and everything works, you start making more over time. And, uh, and now if I was to make a video about that, I would make more than I would make if I was doing that repair. But 
recently the repair rates have come up so much uh in the last couple of years that i ha i don't know the answer yet i'm curious uh we're curious i'm curious to look to see and i can understand now why if yes if you're if you're paying basically a hundred dollars for a setup now which is seems to be becoming more and more of a common rate and i'm and I've, like i've always said this before this has this is regional, right? So if you're somewhere where they're paying forty dollars for a uh, setup, that's fine. But some people are paying two hundred dollars for a setup. It really is where you are, you know what I mean, and where what you have done and who's doing it. But that being said, yes, you know I'm curious to see if we'll see a pickup in the amount of people who are going to do that repair work because one of the toughest reasons why repair work has been so tough to get quality people into it is it's super. It's a, it's a, it's a low paid profession, um, you know, comparatively speaking. So, I mean, it's a really, it's not, you know, I love when people are like, ah, setups are easy. I'm like, uh, solving problems are never easy, right? <laughs> right. Everything's easy until it ain't, so to speak. Right. If anyone who repairs for a living knows exactly what that, uh, that comment means, right. Everything's fine until. You can't figure out what it is and the customer still wants it in the same time frame and you know and you don't get paid extra to do it it's really you know everything can be uh anything can turn into be a problem or hard day um so uh so i, I like I said uh, to answer your question about new techs i'm really curious to see what's going to happen now i think we'll see more people getting uh you know trying to be repair techs again uh, or going back to it as the rates have come up yeah uh, Daniel says 150 seems to be the going rate in shops in NYC. Yeah, I, I'm like, like I said, I it's usually regional, but yeah, hundred dollars setup um, can get kind of pricey. The um, uh, when I was looking at Sweetwater's rates, and I was looking at some other uh, like stores like that where they have you ship guitars, like Chicago Music Exchange, Exchange and stuff, the rates were um, really shocking to me. I was like, I was not prepared for the, how high they have gotten. So you know. So I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> you know, so who knows? Um, Chris wants, uh, Chris says, hey, Phil, advice for someone who wants to learn to do fret work. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge, huge proponent uh, for getting your hands on, when it comes to fret work, just get your hands on cheap guitars and make them playable. Um, and, and again, everyone's going to have a different opinion and and a different piece of advice for you. And so it's not, I never validate my advice with mine's good and someone else is bad, nothing like that. But I need to tell you where my advice comes from. My skill came from taking guitars that were unplayable and making them playable. And it became a thing that I became very proficient at, not, not only good at it, I was fast at it, or I am fast at it, I guess still, right? Um, and so, you know, if you gave me a, I mean, so you give me you give an example, um, and there was a motivation for me under, under, under a lot of circumstances. My first company was making bass guitars. And then I got the idea to, to have them imported from China. And this was in 2000, I think two, please. I'm maybe 2001. I can't remember. Right. It was a while ago <laughs> anyways. And so I bought a container. I had them made. Uh, this is a lot harder back in the day to have stuff made overseas and brought over into the country. You know, it's, uh, still a little bit of the same problems, but it's a lot easier now. Uh, just in paying, right? Just in paying a company overseas, you know, there you had to wire transfer funds and do all this stuff and hope that this company, this factory is going to do what they said they're going to do. And then you have to have a um, customs agent, you know, get the stuff because so, so, you know, when your, you know, your guitars are done, my bases were done. Like they were like, okay, they're done. And you're like, okay, where are you going to ship them? And they're like, they're on the dock for you, buddy. And you're like, oh, which, you know, sarcastically, it's kind of true. You have to have somebody pick them up and ship them. You know, you have a shipping company, which has a customs broker and sets the destination and gets them through customs for you. The reason I tell you that is um, I, I've told the story a long time ago, but it's it's where I, where my skills came from. Um, building a base didn't teach me a whole lot. It, it just didn't. Um, getting 400 bases from China where I would say easily half of them were unplayable uh, was extremely... Uh, <laughs> Uh, that was extremely um, educational, and not not only because I had to do do the all the work, the fret work, and fix everything, but you know you do that many, you got to move, you know you got to get going and get it done, you can get them out there. This is your money sitting in, you know, and at that time in my garage, right? And so um, 
then when you fast forward to I'm I have a store and and I'm doing repair full time in the store as well, and we have a lesson academy. I can't tell you the amount of times. I mean, I, if I say a hundred times, I'd be sarcastically under under you know under guessing the number. A uh, hundred times where a student went to their first lesson, their guitar was unplayable. You know, the teacher would come out, hand me the guitar, and go, "Phil, what do you think?" And I go, "This is this is this is not going to work." And we would do this. We would you know this is where you have to make a decision. At that time, let's say a student was paying a hundred dollars a month for lessons. Uh, and the store gets twenty dollars of that. You know, say twenty dollars of that money, and uh, but it's a residual income, which means if that student comes for the next year, you know, right? That's money. And then of course they upgrade, and so there's a lot of motivation for me to want that kid to stick with that guitar. So, like I said, hundreds of times um, they would go in a lesson with a loaner guitar, and I would literally make that guitar become playable by the time they came out of their lesson, so they could take it home. Um, so my answer to you, Chris is. Uh, get cheap guitars and fix them, make them playable. And I, unfortunately, there's probably better advice out there, but that's how I did it. And that's how I literally made a living, bought a house, you know, right? put my kids to school kind of thing. And so I'll, that's how I value that. I value it in the work. Plus, um, there's no shortage of crappy guitars out there in the world, <laughs> right? right? It's the greatest guitars I've gotten. There's no shortage of you know, glary guitars on Craigslist that need work, um, get, get them and do them and, and do them. And it's, uh, it's as simple as that. And, and the best thing about this is, and this is my, my absolute best advice I have for you, Chris, is every mistake is now your next educational endeavor. So don't worry about like, well, if I pull a fret or if I redo a fret, what, just do it. You know, the first time I ever, uh, screwed up a fret so bad that it was just like the fretboard was no good. I yanked the fret and refretted. Like, I was like, I didn't know how to refret, but I was like, I'm stuck. What am I going to do? That's what happens, right? Anybody who's then again, anybody who's not only professional repair person, just anyone who's done any kind of home repairs knows this answer. Like, okay, <laughs> I think it's worse now. And you just keep going and you keep going. And it's dig, you know, dig yourself into a hole and then dig yourself out of it, so to speak. So that's my advice. Um, maybe get a, uh, a kit right? A, a building kit and then literally, you know, build a kit and do the fret work on that. So, um, you know, that's literally the best advice I can give you. And then of course, you know, what's not, what's awesome now is no matter what happens to you in this endeavor, there are a bazillion free YouTube videos on how to unscrew yourself from the situation you were just in. <laughs> so as soon as you're like, I have no idea where I'm at, just go Google that problem and find that answer. And it's there. And just keep going. So there you go, and uh, and that's and that's just my my thoughts. Okay. Um, this was also last week's question. It says, "Hey Phil, looking for the best bang for the buck metal guitar in the thousand dollar range? Humbucker, humbucker, or humbucker single, single? Any bridge, any tail priest configuration? Any recommendation? Schechter, LTD, Charvel, Jackson? Yes." All of those, you know, what's great about these questions is, um, I love them in the, in the, I love, I would love to answer them 20 years ago. <laughs> I think I could really give you some real good answers like here, this is, you know, go this way right now. Here's what I can tell you. If you have a thousand dollars in your pocket and you want to play metal guitar, it is almost, there is almost a no chance you're going to screw this up for yourself. You're going to find a great guitar. Um, the brands you mentioned, Schechter, fantastic. For $1,000, you can buy a Schechter guitar that will outperform any guitar on the market. Same with LTD, uh, Charvel, Jackson, Ibanez. You can get a, a Made in Japan Ibanez. Don't forget used. You can get Made in Japan Jackson's Ibanez guitars that are fantastic. You can get Made in Korea guitars that are great. Uh, Indonesian guitars are off the charts great. Solar guitars are fantastic. I mean, in, in fact, I can't even mention enough brands. Somebody says, yeah, the Mark Holcomb SE. Exactly, right? Um, and so, and, and that may not sound like an answer, but it is because here's what I'm telling you. What's great is, is you have picked a very, um, safe thing. In fact, I would tell you that a thousand dollars is not the criteria to get a good metal guitar. Um, to me right now, without doing any research, right. And checking and validating anything, I'm just going to shoot from like some memory and some in instincts. I'm going to say, if you had $500, you have no excuse why you can't buy an amazing guitar that fits your needs. 
uh, and uh, and be happy, whether that's new or used. And like I said, don't be afraid of new or used, especially if you get to try the used guitar up front. That's always a nice factor. But there's just tons and tons of guitars out there. There's just a eh, thousand dollars. You know, some of the Kramers I played, they're Indonesian Kramers with the one pickup. I forgot what model that is. It was a fantastic guitar. You know, uh, the e-art guitars that I've reviewed a ton and you see a lot of on the YouTube channels, those guitars are fantastic. And again, a fraction, you're talking about 300 bucks. Me personally, though, if you have more money, $1,000, you can, you have an opportunity to buy a slightly better quality guitar. You can get up there. Um, like I said, I don't think you have a problem buying a $500 guitar and, and get, and finding a, a perfect guitar. But if you get in the $700 range, you'll, you'll, you'll even, you'll, you'll knock that up just a little bit more in quality. But like I said, you can definitely find a great guitar for a thousand bucks as well. So it's a it's a it's a good time to be out there, right? Looking for a guitar. Um, Super Lead One Hundred's question was: Hey Phil, to what degree do you think guitar aesthetics matter over playability or tone? I personally think it it plays a much bigger role than. Uh, many would admit I, I, I have hundred percent think it matters. Um, here's in my opinion of what matters to me. Well, it's not my opinion. What matters to me is what matters to me. Here's what matters to me. The way the neck feels is paramount. That's important. If I can't get vibe on that, it's just over for me. So I'll, I'll never get past that problem. So whatever this is, whatever's happening with my left hand here, if it's too thick, if it's too thin, if it's like weirdly shaped, if it's, you know, something is wrong, there is nothing, and I mean nothing, that's going to make that situation better. Um, after that, it's looks <laughs> for me. So it's like, it's got to feel, and then it's got to look cool as hell. And to be honest with you, it really kind of has to look cool as hell first, and then, you know, there. And and this is what I've done over the years to kind of make that happen for myself. I have guitars that I just dreadfully ugly, and that they play amazing, and then I have them for that purpose. And then I have some guitars that are just, I think, are cool as hell looking, and that's their purpose, right? Right. Um, but no, aesthetics are huge, huge part. Right. Um, I mean, uh, countless amounts of, uh, of professional guitar players out there. Uh, Dimebag Daryl once said in our interview that he plays those guitars because Kiss did. Right. I think that's what he said. Um, you know, that's really common, right? Guitar players just play something because it's cool. It makes you look cool. You feel cool. Right. It makes you feel the vibe. It's why I think I, I I argue that relics have a place because there's just something about vibe, you know, the feeling of something. And so sometimes if a guitar looks like a shiny fluorescent yellow Ibanez, it's hard to play the blues on it. I mean, you can functionally. It makes no sense why you couldn't. But vibe wise, the vibe's not there. It's not you're not feeling it. So, you know, it's something about a beat up Strat is just really cool. So. But um, aesthetics, I think, are huge. And when you say that they play a bigger role than uh, people say, I, I think they play a huge role. I, I can, you know, I think the internet proves that. Yeah, I see how people react to everything, and it's mostly through aesthetics. It seems to be the first thing that people focus on. So let's see. Um, <laughs> some of these, but you know what? I'm just going to go for some weird questions today. Here we go. Guitar man says all the caps. <laughs> Why the hell do we use the term pull the trigger when buying guitar? I would, I, I would guess the reason we do that is because the uh, pulling the trigger in that term and that phrase uh, refers to like, you know, that's the, that's the final moment, right? That's when it happens, so to speak. Right. So like, you know, that's when it gets serious, so to speak, right? Uh, you pull a weapon, that's that's pretty serious, but you pull a trigger, that's that's dead serious. So I think maybe that's where the term comes from, pulling the trigger. So the um, I I don't even know if I use it. I don't know if you're asking me because I use it or other people use it. I've never really paid attention. I might use it because you remember I have a lot of sayings that I just say from the army and they just stick with you. <laughs> just like psh, they just go in your head. Most of the stuff I say either came from stuff my mom told me when I was a kid <laughs> or the army. So, so somebody, you know, just dumping programmed information into your head when you're younger and it just keeps coming out no matter how old you get. Um, let's see. 
Uh, oh, okay. Let's see. Okay, and then uh, Brian says, Brian the moderator says, I need to mention that we have a limited run campaign. Look at this, Brian. I'm almost one ahead of you. Hopefully you guys can still hear me. We have a limited run of Know Your Gear shirts. Um, so if you see the link down below, these are the subdued logos. Uh, subdued means that they are a light gray-ish black instead of a white logo. And you can get them on black shirts or blue or green shirts and stuff like that. So <laughs> I'm sorry to... Delta Tech just said Blue Falcon and it just made me laugh because that's a that's a saying I say a lot. <laughs> so, anyways, Blue Falcon, hilarious. Uh, okay, so <laughs> um, uh, back to shirts. Got to sell shirts, man. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, this was uh, literally because we're still in the process of getting the uh, the new merch up and going, and there's so many comments like, "Hey, I would just like get some merch," and you know, like I said, we've been running six months without merch, so uh, we did this limited run campaign. Uh, to get the shirt. And so if you get the shirt, uh, Scott George says, what about hats? Uh, my wife is working on everything. And like I said, um, she, I put a insurmountable task on her, which is like, Hey, I want all this stuff and I want it perfect. And this is how I want it. And I want it at the right price and I want it to be the right way. <laughs> and, uh, I might've set that, <laughs> set the bar a little high, but either way it's getting done. And, uh, soon this will be all, all available. And, and we'll be good. But in the meantime, if you're interested in supporting the channel and you want to do some merch, you can do the shirts. Um, it's a it's a limited run. Uh, so there you go. Be fun. And it's my favorite. Uh, it's my favorite uh, stick figure shirt, which is subdued. Um, and I don't know if I, I'll tell you the funny story is because um, for a little while, it, the channel, you know, I wasn't thinking when I made my YouTube channel that people like I would be famous. Uh, I'm, I'm not famous, but like people definitely spot me places. And I didn't think about that. I, I don't know why it seems like such an obvious thing that I hey, you make videos on the internet, but like a lot of people make videos on the internet. I didn't like, I'm going to be a YouTube star. I had no concept of how big or small this would get. And, um, and to give you reference, I'm sure you've heard this from other channels, maybe so, but for me, I can absolutely tell you without out any doubt it at all, this channel is 100 million times bigger than I thought it would ever be on its biggest day. Because like I said, I was just trying to get videos to my buddy, Matt. And then when it started growing, I thought, oh, well, maybe this will be something to do on the side from the store and stuff. So the reason I tell you that is um, I used to wear van shirts. Oh, I'm wearing one today. I used to wear van shirts in every video. And I noticed one day everybody in the, in the comment section were like, where'd you get your van shirt? And I'm like, at the van store. Like I was like, what are, are people messing with me? <laughs> I'm like, you get van stuff at the van store. <laughs> so, and uh, and then so many people asked, <laughs> so many people asked about the van shirts. I go, maybe I should have my own shirts, right? <laughs> so I made a shirt, and as you guys know, that was the stick figure shirt. The reason why the subdued is funny is that for um, a long time, if I went in public without thinking about it, I would wear you know this stick figure shirt. And then no hat, my big bald head. And some, and people would say, oh, I know you, or, Hey, are you on the internet? That's how they always used to say it. Right. Um, and I'd be like, yeah, yeah. You know? And I'm like, what are they doing? Why are they talking to me? And <laughs> it's cause they would recognize you. And one day I realized like I was wearing a hat and I was wearing something else and no one saw me. And I noticed it more and more that no one would notice you if it was like the outfit, the outfit is a black shirt white stick figures, bald head. They see you. They're going to go. That's definitely, there's no question. Like, is that the guy on the YouTube? That is the guy on YouTube. And so I, uh, I started doing events. And when I would go to events, if you watch some of those events, I was wearing these shirts that were subdued. I asked my wife, I said, can you make me know your gear shirt so I could use it in the video, but it wouldn't stick out so much when I'm walking around these events. <laughs> and that's where that came from. So that's why I decided to do a limited run of those. Cause it's my favorite shirt. Cause that's one I wear a lot. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's enough to where I get the brand out there, but it's not so much where it's inviting the the oddest questions. And so you guys know, because I've always said this, if you come up to me, please come up to me and say hi. But uh, what's funny is, you can understand, I, um, it's not people coming up to you and saying hi. It's people coming up to you going... Are you on the internet? <laughs> and you're like, yeah. And I go, did you commit a crime? <laughs> you're like, no. Just kidding. They don't say that part, but you can tell they don't, they don't know you where you're from or what you're doing. They just kind of, right. 
And to me, that's not like an interaction. That's the best interaction I have with somebody. <laughs> so you're not sitting there trying to explain who you are to a stranger is the weirdest conversation. I'm thinking it's gotta be. Yeah. It's the weirdest conversation ever. Right. You know, I know you. Yeah. You make videos, I think. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, so there you go. It's a weird thing. Uh, so, <laughs> okay. We got to get back to, uh, um, uh, all right, we can get back to real stuff. All right, this is good. Okay, let's uh, let's deal with some new super chats. We have someone who says, uh, Luis says, hey, Phil, I got an ultra strat neck pickup broke after 1.5 years. Okay, I like to see you said 1.5 years. Uh, Fender warranty uh, center quoted 30 to 60 days, just getting the part. Okay, that makes sense because I can't fix it. They're going to replace it. Uh, is it, well, they can fix it, but they're not gonna, um, is it normal or are there more QC issues with the noiseless pickups that you've heard? The noiseless pickups are a disaster. I've replaced a bunch of them. Uh, and so, you know, in, in all fairness, even though I'm no longer a Fender certified technician, uh, repair person, cause I don't have a, you know, I used to be a de dealer for Fender and stuff. And I used to be certified and repair stuff. Them. Um, just, you know, like my buddy will call me and go, he had a problem and, and obviously I, I can reach out to somebody at Fender and get something done. And so that, that pickup by design is horrible. And, and let me show you why I don't have one. Cause, um, and I'm trying to think if I had one in the shop, I'd pause the show and go downstairs and get it. But I, I either don't have one or I can't think about where it's at, but, um, I always have like a, you know, this is a, a single coil pickup, uh, obviously with no wire on it. So this is just, just a bobbin. Um, and huh, ironically, here's a Seymour Duncan mini humbucker. And this pickup to me, this, this noiseless humbucker by Seymour Duncan is a perfect il illustration. If you ever, if you take a look at the, just go online and take a look at the, the Fender noiseless pickups, why they're a disaster. Um, just take a look at how robust this piece is, this molded, see this molded piece and then these sides with this thick piece of plastic here. And then it comes down here and then the board is inset into this. Uh, if you have older Seymour Duncan, uh, mini humbuckers, um, from back in the, probably the eighties, nineties era or whatever, they don't look like this. And a lot of people are like, Oh, the new molded, you know, thing, it doesn't look that great or whatever, whatever you think is, let me just tell you why that's not going to make sense. Okay. This is definitely from probably having to fix and warranty pickups. Um, because the bottom of your, your pickup is a PC board. And, uh, as Dave Freeman from Freeman amps, I think said it best ever when he was talking about hand wired amps versus PC board amps, he said, look, a PC board amp can be better than a hand wired amp. It just depends on the quality of the PC board, how thick it is, what was done, you know, right? Like the design in it, right? And uh, you know, who, who, who might argue with him? But what's funny is I can't tell you if what he said is 100% accurate. I'm just giving you the information from somebody I think is a credible source. What I can tell you is the same can be said. What he said does mimic what I believe with pickups, which is when they make a pickup like this, like a lot of companies with a board on the bottom, this board is actually pretty thin. And to encase it in this plastic and then separate it See, the board is stopping here. See, this plastic is not, not attached to this board. What Fender did with their noiseless pickups, the board is this bottom gray. That's why it's perfect. It's a gray bobbin right here. The board of your noiseless pickup, the circuit board, is this whole piece. And then they use two metal furls right here on each side. You'll see them. And those furls. And so when this flexes, because as these flex, but this board is thick and it doesn't flex, right? When they flex, the trails, the wires, that, well, they're not wires, they're trails in the board, where they're running stuff, they crack because they're thin. And that's why your pickup doesn't work. You, you basically, your, your boards, the trail on your board cracked and it's because they use a thin board and it's in a situation where let's just be honest, you know, there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong with pushing on the pickups, adjusting the pickup heights. I mean, anything could go wrong. Um, I'm anticipating now you might be responding in your head like, but I didn't do anything and it just stopped working. It doesn't matter because there could be a ton of reasons why those trails break or no longer work or what causes that issue. Um, uh, it could have been something even before, you know what I mean? That's just come now. But in my experience with those pickups, they're absolutely dreadfully, horribly designed and built. Um, and to the point where I feel good saying that because sometimes I, you know, like anybody, I don't want to critique somebody's work. I make pickups. I don't want somebody critiquing my work. I actually critique my work. I don't care. Um, my point is, is that 
it's obvious that other companies have seen the issue and resolved to fix it, i.e. the Seymour Duncan does not ever have that problem or is not likely to have that problem. Never say never, right? Um, and that is obvious to me why this was redesigned like this. It's funny, I had one of these. I wish I had the Fender pickup. And why Fender doesn't correct that, either they don't, well, either they're playing the game of replacing your pickups, one random, two random pickups per whatever, hundred sold is acceptable, or they don't know, or I don't know what the deal is, but either way, that's why you're having that problem. Um, so when you get a new replacement, cause that's what they're going to do is replace your pickup. Um, um, you know what you should do? Uh, do me a favor. Uh, if you could, um, Luis ask for the old pickup. The warranty center is getting a new pickup. They're not fixing that pickup. I'd be really shocked. Okay. Uh, to hear that the warranty center will get a new pickup replacement. They'll, they'll, they pay a reduced rate. It's like 30% off or it's a, it's you negotiate a lower rate with Fender. It's no problem though. Um, they'll do the work and usually Fender wants them to destroy the old part. Ask for it. You know, um, if it was me and you asked me for the old parts, I'd give them to you. <laughs> right. I wouldn't care. Um, you know, uh, but usually Fender says dispose of the parts, you know, they just don't want the parts out there. Um, but in this case, uh, ask them to see if they give it to you. And if they do take a look and see if I, what I say is right. I'm pretty sure I'm right though. That's the issue with that. And so will the new one do it? Yeah. Eventually they're all going to do it. They're going to, they're not going to last over time. It's a really horrible idea. So, you know, <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, to, to give you an example of someone who's improved upon that besides Seymour Duncan is Fishman is also using stuff like that and way thicker. Look at the thickness of those boards. Um, like I said, Seymour Duncan didn't choose to use a thicker board, but like I said, encasing it in this and separating the edge of the board from where it flex, flexes and bends is a good idea. And also, by the way, they also inserted a brass insert, uh, like a, a brass insert into this molded piece of plastic. Again, um, that's years of problems, seeing problems and going, okay, we have to resolve this. That's how they did that. So, um, that's what I'm, uh, so that's your answer. If you like the sound of the pickups, just deal with it. Like I said, they'll, they took care of it for you. You'll have a new one and just be aware of now that's a problem and don't, you know, be cautious when you're messing with the pickups that you can actually break those very easily, by the way. Um, or replace them with something better if that's so choose. But when I say better, keep in mind, I'm not talking about the sound. I'm talking about just the quality of how it's built. Uh, Jeff says, Hey Phil, what would, what would be a good used tube amp for home practice that has reverb or not? <laughs> okay. I don't know. Hold on. We're going, I'm going to keep going, but would prefer it did. Okay. So right. Doesn't have reverb. But you're fine with that. Maybe two channels, shared EQ, 20 Watts or less. I mean, this question, Jeff, I appreciate the question. It's so broad what you're asking, you know, what's a good tube amp for home practice. I mean, I can name 50. Um, you know, <laughs> there's tons, uh, two channel amps that I love. Well, uh, cause I don't have a price or, you know, frame and I don't have a style of music. So, I mean, I could say a blues junior, even though it's a technically a one channel amp. Um, but I know you said you wanted, right. You said two channels and reverb. I mean, it also depends on what you want to spend. So just let me tell you a couple amps that I like and uh, shoot you down a way that may be really cool. Um, used amps don't, uh, you know, there's some Ignator amps that are pretty good on the market. They're really good. Uh, Jet City amps are really good. Uh, used, you know, quality, uh, quality meaning you for the money, right? These are on the cheap side of the money range. You can get some good amps. Um, I actually like the PV classic 20 head. Um, you know, again, if you can pick it up on a, on a, on a good deal, it's got reverb. It's got two channels. It's pretty cool. It's got some extra features. If you got some more scratch to pay, I mean, I love the Fender Supersonic. That definitely puts you into a, a to me, a much higher quality amp than what I just talked about earlier. And, um, you know, that's now you're in the thousand dollar range. Once you're breaking thousand dollar range, I like the Ingle the Fireball 25, but there's no reverb in that. And then I'm looking at like cheating on amps. Um, obviously the, uh, I love the, um, Mesa Boogie Mark V Mini. If you're looking for a higher gain sounding amp, I like the Recto verb uh 25 from mesa boogie that's a really good amp in that um two channel amps ah man uh p uh, no no reverb but i was uh friedman runt uh is a two channel amp but no reverb so 
You can add reverb to that because it's got an effects loop. Um, the 5150 Iconic. <laughs> See, we could go for hours on this. This is really cool. There's a lot of good stuff out there. It's, it's you know, I get these questions and I'd like to just say, I've always, I like answering them, but I always feel bad if I'm just throwing out brands that you can buy. And instead, what I'd really like to talk about for a second, if we could, is how do you just, how when you start this kind of journey, because this is what it is, you're probably looking for your first tube amp or a first good tube amp. How do you decipher where you should go? Because that's the problem. Let's say you have $1,500. I'm just throwing a number out there. Maybe it's $800, right? $800 is probably more reasonable. $800. You know, where do you go with this $800? And first, when it comes to tube amps, um, just because it's tube doesn't mean it's good. I mean, a well-made solid state amp is better than a crappily made tube amp, in my opinion. So, uh, so just be aware of that in the first place. The second thing is don't be afraid to try and look at some of these, um, really good deals out there because it's a brand that people have forgotten, right? The land of the lost toys, so to speak. There's a lot of brands that just aren't cachet right now. And, you know, you can pick them up on the cheap. So, so think about that, you know, um, so a lot of people are mentioning the, uh, Paul Reed Smith MT 15. I really like that amp. It doesn't have reverb, but you can put it in the effects loop, uh, tube Meister. I mean, again, see there will be endless amounts of people and their suggestions and they're all good because they're all good amps. I've either reviewed them or I own them. And I can tell you, I've had really good experience with a lot of them, but what I will tell you is, like I said, it's don't worry about like, if it's tube, just worry about if it sounds good and if it's tube hybrid, don't worry about that. Um, I own, and the reason I say that is I literally own them all. <laughs> okay. All these amps I have hand wired in front of me right now. I have hand wired tube amps. I have ultra crazy expensive boutique off the charts, you know, hand wired with, you know, unicorn powder amps. I have, hybrid amps in front of me that are, that are some tube and some solid state technology. I have solid state amps that I have a modeling Kemper system. Um, I have, you know, I have a mini little one watt amp that I reviewed. That's really good. little tube amp that I highly recommend. Um, the dark, uh, the dark genie gene, the dark gene, uh, red. And the reason isn't not to say, Oh, I have all these amps. Ha ha. It's to say, I have all these amps. Oh, somebody said the boss katana. I have the line six, uh, catalyst, but so, you know, the catalyst and the, and the, and the katana to me are like, you know, just two, you know, two of the same type products. So I chose catalyst over katana, but I could equally be happy with either one. Um, my point is, is that I, I'm giving you my, my experience as someone who's went down this road just for a long time as, you know, trying to go up the ladder to the most expensive amp and get the best thing ever. And what I can tell you is some of the best amps I have, they're nice, but they're not that much better. It just doesn't get that way. It's just, you get to a point where you just know what you need. I need a really good clean sound with reverb. I love that sound. It's something that sounds full and rich with reverb. And I like an overdrive that I can use. And, um, and that's what you do. Right. And like I said, and don't obsess over any particular thing, not so, not so much even a brand. Don't focus on the tube thing. So I have a Fender super champ in the other room that I've been using for the last couple of days that I've had, I've done videos on the back. It's a, uh, it's a hybrid amp. It's a tube power section and digital and solid state front end. It's a fantastic amp. I, you can pick them up still for probably three, 400 bucks used. Great, great amp, especially if you wait, right. You can get them on the cheap. Sometimes people want four or five, six hundred dollars, but you can still get them for three, four. See, VT40 by Vox. Yep. And that's the question. So, you know, and, and that's why I really appreciate your question, uh, Jeff, because in the core of it, it's always like, hey, what amp would you buy? But really, I want to have a discussion about why you should buy an amp and how does it fit your needs? Um, you know, and what does it do for you? And, um, and so, you know, one of my still favorite go-to amps, and it's not on the cheap side, it's expensive, is the Fender Supersonic 22. I just feel like it, it's like, it's a, it's got the Fender clean that sounds great. It's got a decent overdrive that I can get some, some good tones out of. It takes pedals really well. It has a decent reverb. You know, there's some things I don't like. I don't like the atmospheric noise it creates, but 
you know, it's also not $2,000 and the $2,000 amps that I have don't do that, but also it's their $2,000. So that's a great amp. I highly suggest checking out or variances of that. It's like I said, there's all kinds of variances of those Fender amps. Antique Rocker says, I avoid Telecaster because for 60 years, it seems that nine out of 10 times I hear a guitar part I don't like, it's a Telecaster. Am I unreasonable? <laughs> Antique Rocker, are you unreasonable? No. Uh, no, there's nothing wrong with... In fact, if anything, I think you're having what's the most appropriate response to something. I would think that the Telecaster... When I think of guitars that just have a sound, uh, it's the Telecaster, the Les Paul, you know, Gibsons, I guess, or humbuckers, and then Strats, right? When these guitars have these iconic sounds, there's just something that some people don't like about them. The Telecaster, to me, is like a... In my opinion of the Telecaster, there's a, there's a moment where it doesn't sound good, and then there's a moment where it sounds amazing. And I've heard a lot of in-between, and some of, them, some of the sounds are not that great. But I, I love tellies, but I used to not like them at all. If I saw a telly, in fact, like you, I could actually probably pinpoint a time. It was a long time ago, but there was probably a time where if I walked into a bar and I love country music and played in a country band even <laughs> at old Tucson Studios. <laughs> Just to play gigs there. Um, anyways, uh, but as a bass player. But anyways, the point is, uh, there was there was a time in my life where if I walked into a bar and there was a band with it and the guy had a telecaster, I'd probably go, ugh. I'm done. I'm not listening to this <laughs> and I'm leaving. Um, but then something clicked and, and I love them. I don't know. Um, you know, for lack of a better kind of connection, I like, a I like in the Telecaster to sushi. It's, it's a love hate thing. I don't think there's a whole lot in between. You don't meet a whole lot of people are like, yeah, sushi's okay. It's either like, I love sushi. Let's go. Or no. <laughs> or in my, in my experiences, do they serve anything else? <laughs> <laughs> so that's what it is, man. The Telecaster is your sushi. You either love it or hate it. Um, and uh, but let me know if um, let me know if any of you are indifferent to Telecasters. Is, is that is, is that a thing? I just don't think of it as the Telecaster as being that kind of guitar, right? It's like it's like a banjo. I said sushi. You know, it's a better analogy. Banjo. You either like it when you hear a banjo, you go that's cool, or you go oh no. Uh, Brian says sushi is bait. <laughs> it can be. It's expensive bait at that point. Jared says, happy Friday, Phil. Have you seen the new, no, the SBS guitars from Guitar Fetish? I bought the VS200 on a whim. Have they reached out to you on them yet? Uh, I have not seen them. I'm familiar, obviously, with Guitar Fetish. Uh, uh, Valiant, a, a viewer of the channel, sent me two um, Guitar Fetish guitars, and then we gave them away. Um, they were the slick guitars by Guitar Fetish. And then, um, those got crazy views. Cause as sometimes, you know, sometimes those deep dives go crazy, you know, a couple hundred thousand views kind of thing. Sometimes they get lucky and they go out there and, uh, Guitar Fetish actually reached out to me. This was a couple years ago during the beginning of the pandemic or mid pandemic. And, uh, uh, I forgot what my response was, but it was always the same kind of response back then, which is like, yeah, how about you pick a guitar and I pick a guitar I'll do two videos. That's what I used to offer to companies. I stopped because so many companies said no to it. And to be honest with you, they're idiots, idiots uh, for not doing that. I can say that now with reflection. I had no idea at the time they were idiots, but now looking back, oh my God, um, I would go, hey, why don't you send me a guitar? Uh, I'll pick a guitar. You pick a guitar. I'll do a video of both. And then if I like one, I'll keep one. And they go, and Guitar Finish was one of those companies that said basically no to that. And um, so, you know, I probably sold hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of guitar stuff for them uh, in those videos. So I don't know why they wouldn't take that. Now, I can tell you right now, in case this ever gets to sent to Guitar Fetish, it's $2,000 to a charity of my choice. That's what you get if you want to be on this channel. Um, if you guys want a Guitar Fetish guitar, like a lot of guitars, like the Rickenbacker and stuff, I will buy it and I'll put it on the channel. Um, but like if a company reached out like them, it's minimum to start at $2,000 donations to charity. And that's the minimum we start this conversation um, because, like I said, they make so much money. I know uh, because what's changed, this is why I know they're idiots, is um, I helped uh, start co-start a brand of guitars with my friends and we sold out literally in minutes. And I know now, looking at data, how, how many millions of dollars the channels were sell uh, this channel, this channel, not much less other channels, ch this channel has sold for companies. And... Um, I'm not here to say they got to pay me to be on the channel, but sometimes I laugh when I look back and going, you know, I gave them 
opportunities that were literally gifts, <laughs> right? I mean, just absolute gifts of, of opportunity to get some really good sales at and marketing and get themselves in front of uh, you amazing group of people. And that's what it is. Like I said, they don't care about me and they shouldn't. They should care about you. They care about you guys. You guys are not only amazing viewers and supportive community, but you guys are guitar enthusiasts and freaks like me. And so you tend to buy a lot of stuff. And um, and so now, like I said, we do that all the time. I, I say this all the time. If you're in the US, you may know what this means. I don't work for free unless you're a 501c. Um, if, if a company comes at me, and they want me to do a content and it's a really good opportunity for me and them, I do it. If it's something that you guys have been interested in. Oh, actually, you know what? And this is a perfect example. Let me let me run this by you guys. Let's do something right now. Let's be a community for real. Okay. Since that since that connected. But so you guys know, just to the person that asked the question, I like guitar fetish stuff. There's no issue with there. And like I said, I I'll 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 tell you guys, please go to their site. And the fact that they didn't take that deal, that just means their marketing guy was dumb. It doesn't mean that the product is bad. So don't confuse the two issues. However, like I said, maybe if they want to, they can. we can get some money donated to a charity and we'll get a deep dive of one of those guitars. I would love to do that. Especially, like I said, if you can do do two cool things, make a cool video and do something cool for somebody else, like a, uh, we'll do it. But here's, a, here's an email. Let me go. I'm going to share an email with you guys. And I've been perplexed. By this email, I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to do what you guys say. Okay. Um, so here is the question to you. Please understand, I'm just trying to. Okay. So let me let me uh, explain the backstory on this, and then you guys be ready with the comments. Uh, for the yes, no, that's what I'm going to ask you. Yes, no, I'm going to get a general vibe. I'm not going to actually count the yes or no's just the eyes will have it. So to speak, if it's yes, I'll do it. If it's no, I won't. So be prepared. There's a thousand of you. Here is the question that I was presented with that I'm having an issue with a couple years ago. You guys asked me over and over again to do a Dean Zelensky guitar, right? Um, you really wanted me to do a deep dive of that neck. It was asked and asked about by the uh, patrons. It was asked um, for the uh, for you guys on the on the um, what do you call it on the uh, podcast, right? And um, I reached out. I never heard anything from them. I never got anything. This is you know I don't do it anymore. I don't solicit companies anymore. But back then I would reach out going, hey, I have a you know a quarter million subscribers in here. I would show them a clip of the video. They're all asking me to check out one of your guitars. Let's do it. And I didn't get anywhere with uh, Zelensky guitars. And so what I did is what we do on this channel is I have patrons and I took the patron money and I bought the guitar, uh, the Z Glide guitar. Um, hold on. I'm actually pulling up a report uh, on that guitar. Uh, I did that guitar February 8th of 2022 uh that guitar uh the z clay guitar the deep dive video it did it's uh this data hasn't been updated since last year uh that video shows it did 133,000 video uh views um i paid 1300 for that guitar i was able to sell that guitar for 800 because i bought it new and of course i sold it used and that's just what it was and at that time if you know uh february of 2022 you couldn't find them used otherwise i would have bought a used one and did the video but i couldn't um so the video at 133,000 views made $583, which is really would be normally pretty good. $600 for a couple days work seems pretty good. So that video currently is showing I have, am in the whole $83. <laughs> okay. Why am I sharing that with you? I'm sharing that with you because a couple days ago, Dean Zelensky himself, uh, you know, and who's somebody who I respect, reached out and said, Hey, Phil, I appreciate your coverage of the uh, Stratavita model. Would you have any interest in reviewing the, I, I'm going to say, tal, I'm not sure how he's saying this model, ta, Tag Alary, I don't know, ATW model. I'm, I'll get the pronunciation right later. Um, has 18 distinctive tones uh, done through wiring, no circuitry. Um, let me share. This is the model that it, he's talking about. It's a $1,600 guitar. Essentially, this would be, like I said, he's reaching out and we get to borrow the guitar, do a deep dive for you guys. And uh, 
So why am I sharing uh, with this is that um, after I did that video, uh, believe it or not, Zelensky's marketing guy reached out to me and said, hey, thank you for the deep dive on the video. It did really well, um, you know, and uh, I said, OK, and thank you so much for saying that. He was like, hey, oh, would you like to do another video? And I responded with, yeah, why don't you pick a guitar? I pick a guitar. I'll do two videos. And if I like one of the guitars, I keep one and uh, ghosted. <laughs> so the question now is. I will do this guitar if you guys want to see this guitar on the channel. Um, if you guys uh, are not super interested in it, I will respond to him with what I said I will respond, which is please, uh, you know, if you want to pay $2,000 to a charity, I usually do guitars for vets or children's hospital. However, if they have a charity they're passionate about, they pay the charity and then I'll do the video. But like I said, I, like I said, I don't work for free unless you're a 501 C. In other words, I'm not here to help companies get richer. Uh, I'm here to entertain you guys and make a living doing that. And also if I can raise money from charity sometimes, that's kind of cool too. Um, so again, uh, I would just, it's, I really, that's what I want to know if you're interested in it, right? A lot of no's, a lot of yeses, no's, yeses. Oh man, it's the worst. It's like 50, 50. No. <laughs> uh, you know, and so, you know, Susan says, since they ghosted you, you know, that's not what I take in offense. People ghost. And so, you know, they're employees. They could be, it wasn't Dean Zelinsky who didn't uh, email me back. It was the guy. Um, I'm never upset about that. I just, like I said, I'm just not going to offer that same deal to them. That was a too good to be true deal back in the day. A lot of no's. Do me a favor. Um, Amanda, uh, the moderator who is amazing here. Amanda, do me a favor and don't count these, but if you could just get the sense of Amanda's still here, right? <laughs> if Amanda's here, if she could get the sense of whether or not it's a yes or not, uh, no. Otherwise, I'll ask uh, the wife to tell me if the sense is yes or no. I'm just looking at it right now, and it's like a lot of, I feels like it's almost, like the no's maybe winning a little bit, but it's, <laughs> Jess says, what are we voting for? So um, anyone, anyone, Bueller? Maybe if Amanda's not here, we'll delegate it to Brian. Brian, guitars, can you can you tell me if you think it's a yes or no? Somebody just type, you know, one of the, either my wife, um, Amanda. Oh, Amanda's here. So yeah, if one of you can just, again, don't count those. She says there's a lot of no's. Just give me the sense of that and then we'll figure that. By the way, if you guys say no, I'm still going to say yes to him, but he's got to donate money to charity, right? To get it on the channel. And that way, at least some, you know, like I said, because I think it's like one of those things, you guys will hate it if I make a video, but... If you guys really want the guitar, I won't do that because there's a huge chance he might say no. You know, that's what happens. To all these companies, when I tell them they got to do a donation to charity, they just, they don't respond. Um, because, so you guys know, and so there's no uh, miscommunication here. Um, a lot of times when I ask companies if they will do a thing for charity, a lot of them will say no. The reason is, is because whether or not they paid me to do it or they pay the charity, it's it's the same to them. It's a write-off to them. It's a cost and a write-off. They, they don't care. They either don't want to do it or not. Um, so yeah, overall is no. So we'll, here's what we'll do. We'll find out. So now you guys will know. I'm going to reach out to uh, them, uh, Zelensky Guitars, and say, yes, I'll do the video for $2,000 to one of my charities or a charity that they pick. Um, uh, and then if you see it on the, on the channel, then it's good. So see, that's how, this, that's how we do it. Like I said, I, I tend to do the videos the same way. If a company wants me to do the video, they gotta they gotta sponsor the video. If you guys want a video, then we'll do it, right? And a lot of times we're either using the sponsor money the, or the patron money. That's how we keep the channel going. Um, or like sometimes I'll have the channel uh, the chair uh, the company do a charity thing, and that way that kind of works too. It's just I try to find a way to work with every company that's beneficial to somebody. But mostly, I want it to benefit either you guys, me, or a charity. I really don't care if the companies benefit <laughs> as a whole. You understand? Because I know they do. The content in alone does the benefit. All right. Uh, Jared says, happy Friday, Phil. No, that was when we did. T-sized says, I wonder what that means. What's T-sized mean? That's, I mean, it's a, a T-sized. I'm like, like I, if you said XL sized, I'd be like, you're a bigger guy. <laughs> T-sized. You're tall? Is that T-size where he's tall? She's tall? They're tall? Okay, it says, Happy Friday, Phil. What is your take on the vintage Gibson T-top pickups? Maybe he's into T-top pickups. Um, I played a 70s Les Paul recently and felt like it had more everything compared to my Seth Lover equipped LP. Um, 
per personally, me personally, Gibson pickups just are bigger sounding, louder, more powerful. Uh, they push the amps more. There's just something about the Gibson style pickups that like Seymour Duncan and DiMarzio and uh, my pickups. And I'm just using that because that's, you know, because, you know, I'm, I'm modeling mine after a Gibson style pickup. Um, there's just something about the Gibson pickups. You know, it's a, it's a love hate relationship with them. They just seem to be a little uh, more powerful. And, um, uh, oh yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> My wife says, should we do a poll? Yeah. If you can put a poll, a thing on there, do that. Uh, so anyways, uh, so to answer your question, if you're asking me, are those pickups, do they sound better? The Gibson T tops, do they sound better because they're from the seventies. Um, my, my answer is no. Right. I, I don't really believe in that a lot. Okay. Um, I do believe, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about pickups, uh, you know, as they get older, they get demagnetized. Um, you know, I, I saw Dylan Talks Tone talk about this. I was listening to a show. This is probably six months ago or longer. And he was saying he tested it. I was very interested in this because I have never tested it. And it's one of those things like if somebody's done it, I'd like to hear what they did. He 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 tested the he basically tests the gauze of a magnet on a pickup. And then I think he he tested it like a couple days later and then a couple weeks later. And what he said was there was a little bit of dip off, you know, it dropped a little bit, but then it stayed and it just continued to stay. And what's funny is that's what I would think would happen. Like, I can't imagine that they really kind of lose their magnetic ability, you know, and soften. I mean, we, we say soften um, a huge amount over years. And that's where the magic is. Um, there's a lot of that out there. So, you know, there's a lot of, uh, pickup manufacturer Seymour Duncan does this where they will basically um, uh, slightly, uh, you know, kind of degauss the magnets a little bit, right? To give it, they're gonna, it's going to sound like an old pickup because we've kind of weakened the magnet a little bit or, um, you know, done it that way. Um, but in my experience, it's not, there's nothing magic from the pickups um, from the 70s. Uh, or the 80s or the 90s or the 50s or whatever. It's like, in other words, the magic being the distance of their age. It's it, the magic of them. The sound is there in their construction and the way they're made and how big of a magnets under that thing. Because that's, uh, you know, Gibson. I wish I had them here, um, but I can show you. I actually have some some uh, magnets from old Gibson pickups uh, from the late 60s, early 70s. I have two or three of them and they're different lengths. And it's because at different years and different production runs, they cut money, they would shorten the length of the magnet, which decreases how much magnetic, you know, how much, uh, how much magnetic energy is there, um, which is a big factor of the sound of the pickup, right? The magnet's a huge part of that. So I'm going to say that you're saying, so here's my opinion. If you're saying that you like the sound, cause that's more important, right? We're not saying better. We're saying you liked it. You prefer the t-top pickups the 70s t-top pickups sound on that les paul compared to your seth lover pickups i'm going to say that if you got similar pickups uh and put them in your les paul you would get closer to what you are hearing with that one guitar will they be exact no but no two things are exact and that's silly right it's like it's like i have a 1984 don't ask why i have a 1984 tube screamer and i have a modern tube screamer and if you listen to them the 84 sounds a little bit softer, like a little bit smoother and warmer a little bit, a little bit, but I can't tell that unless I AB them. By. <laughs> and then I go, Oh yeah, yeah. That's a little bit right. If you ask me to pick them out, you're like, you just played one and never gave me reference the other. I would never be able to do it. So that's the, sometimes I were, I caution sometimes a being, I've told you this before. This is why I backed off from a being a lot on the channel. Um, to me, A being two different things is important because it gives you reference. Like I said, when I did the two tellies, the two uh, PRS tellies recently, um, they were different pickups, different guitars. So hearing one being a little bassier and one being a little trebler, treble, more treble, you get the idea, right? However, when you AB things like, you know, these pickups and stuff, um, you know, it, I, when I mean A being, I don't mean the Seth Lovers to the Gibson pickups. I mean, the, the, those Gibson T-top pickups to more modern Gibson style pickups. The difference will be minimal, but it will be minimal. It'll be minimal, so therefore it's minimal. I don't know what the hell I'm saying. <laughs> Usually I'm two hours in and I'm not making any sense. Now I'm, I'm doing it early. So, um, but that's just my guess. Again, that's my guess of what you're hearing. Um, I, 
as a rule, <laughs> when I'm plugging my Gibson guitars into amps, I, t I tend not to like to plug um, any other guitar into the amp right after the Gibson. Um, because again, the pickups always sound a little bit more brighter, more mid rangey, and there's less push on the amp. And the amp's not as loud because the pickups, think of it like a hot mic. The Gibsons are really hot. And that's just how they, that's how they make pickups. Uh, Adrian says, Hey Phil, happy Friday. And when was this happy Friday? Is that, I think my funny thing is I think, I think happy Friday cause the show, but I forget sometimes it's happy Friday cause you guys did a work week and now it's the weekend. To me, my work week doesn't work like that. So, um, whether I work the weekend or not is, is, you know, it's, I, I, I do. <laughs> okay. Um, says any thoughts on Stu Mac price cuts? They're insane. Would love your perspective on it. Sure. This is again, what we talked about at the beginning of the show, the market is officially soft. So Stu Mac has reduced the price on, does it, uh, is it on their website? I know they sent the email and I know Ali, who I deal with at Stu Mac, who does our affiliate stuff, um, sent me a thing saying, Hey, tell all your viewers, blah, blah, blah. The price has dropped. I didn't do it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm like, see, I, this, I'm so dumb. I should have done it. Or I'm like, hey, don't forget, buy stuff. Um, It says 10% off your order. But so you know, it's not officially on their website, but they did send out an email and I'm aware of it because actually the marketing people at uh, StuMac uh, reached out to me as well, um, probably around when I was traveling. Um, StuMac has cut the prices significantly on 125 or 150 items. You know what I will do for you guys is I will stop guessing since I just realized that I have a folder right here and it has Stu Mac and Ali is the marketing person. And it says exactly it was, we have, this is a email communication from uh Stu Mac marketing to me. And it's, uh, she's letting me know that they have been making big uh, moves lately. She just let me know they have lowered the price on 125 of their best selling product categories. Oh, categories. So it's even more than more than 125 products, 125 categories. Um, when you consider all the variations of products, color metrics, that's a uh, oh, 600 SKUs. Okay. Translates to 600 SKUs. So 600 SKUs items on Stumac have been lowered an average of 37%, which is a lot for the real world for Stumac. This is like, uh, oh, it's about almost right. <laughs> uh, look, I love Stumac, but like you guys, I'm like, you know, Hey, I'm not, I, I buy this stuff. I'm not a fan of the prices though, of course. All right. Who wants to spend money? Nobody. Uh, anyways, it says, um, uh, so, uh, some of them are 25% off. Some are 85% off. Uh, so, you know, um, uh, so give an example, the fret tang nipper that I use, which is the thing I show you guys, how you do, uh, a, a spherical, uh, hemispherical frets. I've done that video where I show you take off the the tang on the end with it. It's uh, that dropped 40 bucks. The fret kisser that I, uh, I use in, in, in your video that I love, um, that dropped $33. The loser, lo losers, the losers, digital, the luthiers, <laughs> digital caliper <laughs> dropped $18. Uh, the, oh, my screwdriver set that I love the red screwdriver set. That's 50 bucks. That's ridiculous that I love, but it's ridiculously expensive. Dropped $17. So that, that's cool. I think it was 55. So that puts it at like, 38, still pricey, but much better than 55. The string action gauge, which I don't use, has uh, dropped $3. Um, so uh, this guys let you know. And if you, if you guys, what? If you guys, you can't call them and get a better deal. So in that case, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it's in my link description. Let me show you. Let me see. Yeah, if you go to my guitar set tools, that link down below, if you click that link and buy any of this 2Mac stuff, I get a piece. Uh, so, you know, I still get a piece. Uh, here's something cool to note. Um, when I read that email, just I like to talk about business and integrity and people a lot. It's really important. Um, StuMax deal is very, very good. No company, none, pays me as much on a click as StuMac. Um, and it's not spe specific to me. All the channels that tell you like Texas toast will say, Hey, if you click the link down below, Dylan talks to all the channels, they'll say, Hey, if you click the link down below for Stu Mac, you know, we get a piece of that, right? A commission almost like a, it's a percentage. Um, no one gives us as much as Stu Mac. And, um, and so, you know, I work with Stu Mac to develop that deal because, um, I told Stu Mac, one of the hardest parts about working with him is 
that uh, there's no incentive, you know, to to work with them for you guys. And that's when they did that deal where you guys got the the uh, free freight deal and stuff that a lot of you guys did. But um, my point is, is that um, when they sent that email saying, hey, we cut the prices by 30 something percent on their on their website, I thought they were going to discount how much they pay the channels and they didn't. So I will tell you right now, um, they give me 10%. So that's a lot. And I'm telling you that because no one comes close to that. No one. There's nothing. Don't think anybody's making that. So don't start like a thing like these YouTubers get 10% of whatever I spend. That is an obscene amount of money. Just give a reference. Amazon gives 1%. <laughs> and most companies, they may give a point or two more than that. But a lot of them have so many just uh, exclusions that a lot of things you're clicking and stuff, you know, you don't get credit for some of that stuff. So I'm just telling you guys, if you do buy from Stu Mac and get the deal, their discounts, their new discounts. If you use my link in any of my videos, um, I get a piece too, a pretty good piece. So I appreciate that. It doesn't cost you anything. It's that speech, right? I think every YouTuber does it. It doesn't cost you a penny, but it helps my channel a whole lot, which is true. It sounds corny, but it's true, man. It's a, remember the YouTube game, game is just all pennies. How many pennies can we get each day collected up? So thank you guys for that. And thank you, Adrian, for bringing up this, the price cuts. I should have done it. Like I said, she sent it to me, but I was in travel and I wasn't thinking about it. And, um, and, uh, and by the way, if you guys don't have the, uh, so, so, oh, this is important. If you guys didn't sign up for the program where I, we got you the deal where you got the free shipping for a year with Stu Mac, don't do it right now because in that email to me, she asked me if we want to do that again. And so we're going to do that again. So if you miss that opportunity, it's a deal where you get basically half off their, their program. We'll set that up for you guys. So we'll have that soon. I'll email her and, and, and that way you guys can get that. And so again, cause it saves you money. That stuff that doesn't do me any, like I don't get anything for that. That's just important. Cause I'd rather you guys pay half. I mean, it's 50% off. So I'll, I'll talk to her about that. There was something in the email she sent me about, if you want to do that again, we can offer that 50% off deal for your viewers. And I'm like, okay, let's do that. So, um, don't sign up and pay full price yet. Uh, Litve, but if you already signed up from last year, use it. Uh, Litve, hey man, what's up? Litve says, hey, do you know anything about Epiphone P90 Pro pickup? They seem lower wound and Alnico 5s over, wait, the lower wound and Alnico 5s overwound and uh, ceramic predecessors. Keeper swap. I don't know anything about them. And so, I mean, I'm, I really can't give you a reference of that. Uh, as you know, um, I, I prefer the ceramic magnet in the p90 because i like the throttle it like i like like i like like i said i like p90s to be a karate chop to the throat <laughs> like it's it's it i was gonna say it's hammer time as i do a karate chop it's hammered it's karate chop time uh so i like that but of course like if you guys know i did dylan's pickups and his were the elninco fives and his uh the way he wound his you get more clarity that way so um so, I mean, I don't know, I don't have reference to those pickups, but I can tell you that's the two P90s I, I like a lot. I like Seth Lovers, not Seth Lovers, Lindy Freeland's P90 as well, but, um, but I don't even know. I've never bought one of the Lindy Freeland P90s. I just have one of my Gibsons that came with it when I bought it used and I really like it. So uh, I say that because I don't know what model it is. I just know I like the way it, the way it sounds. Dan says, hey, have you seen the new guitar fetish line? Oh, we did this. That's a different viewer. Different one you want really want me to know the guitar fetish thing. <laughs> Maybe you guys are really interested in it. Like I said, if you're interested in it, we'll do it. We'll buy it and we'll put it on the channel. That's the that's the great thing. Uh, Mike says, new guitar week, 2005 Gibson R7 gold top. Um, when is the first, re first review coming? Oh, man. I love when you guys do that. When's the Nags review coming? When's the Strandberg? They're coming. Keep in mind, uh, my wife uh, and uh, was kind enough to do some, uh, uh, I don't know what you call it, interference for me this week with companies because I got companies like, same with you guys, like, hey, when's this video coming? And she's like, just so you know, he lost his voice. I lost my voice for almost two weeks. I know I did last Friday's show, but that was, as you know, I was lozenged up. Like I had prepared all day. That was the most I had talked is that Friday. So I was dead for a whole week with, I mean, you know, when it comes to videos, you know, you can't have a good video if you don't have my a beautiful voice and this wonderful face. 
<laughs> so anyways, uh, what's the answer to that? Uh, coming, everything's coming, man. I have a cool video that I'm really excited about that's coming. Um, and I don't know if it'll do well, but I don't care. I'm very excited about it. And that's going to be, I think, next. And it involves an Epiphone. Um, okay, so uh, Brian says, hey, is there any GX2 release updates? He's talking about the Badlands guitars. Uh, yes, I will talk about Badlands guitars, but like last week, we're going to reserve anytime we talk about the Badlands stuff, we'll talk about it at the end of the show and it'll always be as a, uh, you know, again, not about so much like, you know, selling you the Badlands or people who bought Badlands, but talking about the, what we learned, what I'm learning so far, what's going on. Um, wait, what? <laughs> okay. So, all right. So. Uh, next, uh, Brian, Brian says new amp day, limited edition Vox AC 15 with cream back speaker from GC. Hard to believe how much better it sounds than the stock greenback. Yeah. I, I love greenbacks. I love vintage thirties. I, I don't know what it is. Creambacks. I, again, I, I caution you guys as I get older, like a lot of people, as you get older, your hearing changes somewhere it, out of nowhere. Um, and so, you know, I, I, reason I know that to be the case is, um, 2018, I was, uh, I was talking to Pete Thorne on a bus, <laughs> right? Uh, we talked about a ton of things. And one of the things we talked about, I've talked about some of the other conversations we had, but one of the things we talked about was speakers and I asked him what speaker he loves. And he said, the creambacks, he really likes those speakers. And I was like, oh, and so I did what you do when Pete Thorne tells you he likes a speaker. I bought one when, as soon as I got back, I ordered a cream back and I put it in a cabinet and I didn't like it. And he even said he liked the neodymium one and I bought that one and I didn't like it. So I had these two cream backs sitting in the boxes in my uh, shop downstairs for a while. That was 2018. Oh, that was 2017. I'm sorry, 2017. Time goes by fast. Anyways, 2017 like September-ish, I think. So anyways, um, a couple of years ago, I just tried a speaker cabinet, had a cream back in it and I loved it. And then I pulled those cream backs out and stuck them in another cabinet and loved it. And just something about them now, like I said, I just love everything that they're doing. I like the top end. I like the lower end. I just like them. So yeah. And I have a, I have a, a couple of green backs that I still love, but for some reason, the cream backs just appeal to me more. Um, Drew says, Hey, new guitar day bridge pickup, a 498 T works, but only seven K half of what it should be and exhibit 60 cycle hum. Ooh, that means it's dead buddy. Uh, <laughs> is it only one coil? Yeah, that's exactly what that means. Easiest way to test. You just did it. <laughs> 60. So here's how it works that you've done, uh, two of the three things you're supposed to do to test that pickup. So uh, for clarity, what he, what we're talking about with uh, uh, Drew here is he's got a humbucker, a Gibson humbucker, and he's what he's saying is is that when he puts it on the multimeter, it's supposed to read about 14k, right? Because I'm assuming that because he said it's reading 7k, which is half uh, 14k, and and so it's only getting half um, the resistance, right? Uh, that it's supposed to be getting, which means that it's not running the signal's not running through all that wire, right? That's where all that resistance is coming from, the length of the wire. So we expect that that pickup should have a, approximately 14K pickups gonna have two uh, bobbins with somewhere between 6,000 wines, maybe 5,000 wines. I don't, I do it off memory. I don't, I don't keep track anymore. It's like, you gotta stand the winders downstairs are like GPS. I don't, I don't even know where I'm going anymore. The GPS tells the same with the winder. It's set, you know, each pickup I make, it's just set with the winders, but let's say it's 6,000 wines. That sounds about, that sounds right for some reason. Maybe it's 5,000 wines. It might be 5,000 wines. So 5,000 wines, and so let's say 5,000 wines gives you 7K. What's supposed to happen is when there uh, is that when you run the multimeter on the, hum the humbucker, the whole thing, both coils, you should be getting double that, which is uh, 14K. So my guess would be one that you're getting half means you're only getting one coil, but then because you're hearing 60 cycle hum, that means that one of the coils isn't activated. So you've done the right test. You did your audio test with your ear. You did the uh, t measurement test with the multimeter. Now you want to do a tap test. So what you want to do is you want to plug the amp into a, uh, or plug the amp, plug the guitar into an amp that's on clean channel, put the volume moderate because you don't want to damage the speaker. I like a screwdriver, like a Phillips head screwdriver, something that you can tap on one of the slugs or screws or both. And now you want to go to the pickup, 
uh, put it in, and obviously if it's got a coil split mode, here, there's good news though. Hold on, I have good news after this. And then what I want you to do is tap each side of the pickup. Like, like I said, one, one side slugs, one side screws. And when you tap on them, you should hear a really th a loud thump like I'm tapping on a microphone. And the next one you should hear almost nothing, uh, maybe atmospheric sound of the other uh, coil hearing it, right? But it'll be much different, much more aggressively different. However, keep in mind that, because I don't, what I hear, that's what I don't know. What I don't know is the 498T you have, I don't know if it's four conductor or two conductor, because I'm not, I'm not sure, I'm not versed in that exact pickup, what it is off memory. So here's the good news. If it is four conductor, what could be happening is, is that just, it's not a bad pickup. It's not defective. It's just the two wires are just disconnected from each other, right? You have two wires that would be coil split or it's hooked up to a uh, potentiometer, a push pull pod or something that coil splits it and it's hooked up wrong or there's a short in it and it's just staying coil split all the time. So um, that's again, an easy, easy fix uh, to diagnose. And, um, but uh, that's the other thing you want to just, uh, you know, decipher. What I will do for you real quick, just because I don't, you know, some people won't know if you, until you try it. Gibson 498T. I'm sure that uh, there could be multiple versions of this. I want to see what comes up when I pull it up. What comes up is I'm seeing a four conductor pickup when I pull up that model of pickup four conductor wiring. So the good news is my guess is that one of the coils is not bad. That is not the likely scenario. The likely scenario is that there's two wires that should be uh, tied and soldered together. They have become unsoldered together or they are soldered to something that coil splits them and that is shorted out um, and that's what's killing it. Now the easy fix uh, would be if it is soldered to a potential or something, go ahead and desolder that. Uh, just tape it off with a piece of tape and everything should be go back to normal. And then you can, from there, diagnose where the short in your electronics is. So, so I hope that helps. And if you, if it is a two conductor, yeah, somebody, Brian says they come in both. So if it is a two conductor, well, then you have a bad coil. That's just, can that be fixed? Absolutely. But you said no new guitar day, so it's under warranty. Don't fix it. Um, thank you, Robert, for the super chat. Brighton says, does string through top loading affect tuning stability? No, that's not what it would affect. Uh, whether you string through the guitar or you top load a bridge, uh, has no effect on tuning stability at all. That wouldn't, um, here's, here's what it does affect. It does affect the feel of how the strings can feel when you bend, right? That's about it. <laughs> That's about now in that small explanation I just gave, is there a possibility that, you know, you may be knocking a guitar out of tune when you, cause you're bending so much cause it's easier to bend one way than the other. That's possible. But I, I, not that I've seen usually if you're, if you're knocking guitars out of tune cause you're bending so extreme, you're just using too small of gauge of strings. you right. Yeah. <laughs> like it's time to, it's like a weight set. It's time to upgrade the weights, right? Um, I love nines, but it, you know, if you find you can bend nines, like they're like, you know, rubber bands, then maybe you should go to tens, you know, and then, and if those get tough for a while, then go back something like that. Um, but no, it doesn't affect tuning stability. That's anything that, that wouldn't not, not that I've ever experienced with any guitars. Uh, grumpy Mike guitar says, just want to say thanks for Friday hang still my favorite part of the week. My best to the fam. Cheers. I appreciate that, man. I appreciate you saying that, that it's the best party week. Um, I just watched your Epiphone video. When did I watch it? Yesterday? I don't get to watch. And when I say watch, I always say loosely. It's in the background. <laughs> I have to play them in the background when I'm doing something. And then, um, and then uh, you know, kind of like I look. Like, oh, what's he talking about? I looked. <laughs> it's like, I think when you were talking about the wood being different on the Epiphone versus the Gibson, I was like looking like, oh, what's he talking about? Um, and I uh, really like that uh, Gibson, uh, Epiphone SG. If you guys don't, I will put a link when I talk about Mike's video. Um, you know, it was, it, it's a good video, man. It's, it's, uh, it's a cool guitar. That's a, I'm a big fan of SGs and I'm a big fan of Epiphone SGs. So I actually prefer Epiphone SGs over all other Epiphones for like, if they're, I'm not saying that's the only Epiphone I like. I'm just saying when I think of Epiphones, you know, like when I question my, my senses of like, why do I own a Gibson over Epiphone? 
and I've explained this in the past, it's usually for collectability more so than anything else. <laughs> um, the SG is where sometimes I have trouble, you know, justifying in my head, why don't I just have an Epiphone? They're almost the same damn guitar in almost every way. The few things that are different are just subtle. Um, <laughs> uh, scent of a wheelchair pillow says, do you have any words filtered out on Super Chat? I can't get my original question thought no matter what I do. There are insane amount of filtering on the channel. Um, I've eased back some of the filtering. The problem, as you guys know, is that there are con artists out there and they're constantly trying to take advantage of people by that whole like, hey, it's Phil McKnight, text me. Or, hey, it's Phil McKnight, you want a guitar, just give me some money. Um, I've never asked anybody for anything when they've won something. So that's the first problem, okay? So if you get somebody saying they're Phil McKnight, and, and also this comes up a lot, but what really is confusing is um, sometimes it confuses people because you know, you're like watching, a, like I saw on Rick Beato's channel, somebody was on Rick Beato's channel. And then it was like somebody, like somebody, there was a, there was a, a, a fake person saying they were Rhett Shaw, like, Hey, you won. And I'm like, uh, I don't know why that makes sense to somebody, but they were doing it. So to an answer your question, what's filtered? Yes, there are things that are filtered. When I say filtered, it just means I have to constantly approve them. I have to approve comments five to seven times a day. I just made those two numbers up. It feels like every couple hours I'm filtering. I'm constantly, um, just pulling up the comment sections and just like, yes, yes, go through, go through, go through, go through. Um, and, uh, and it's because you gotta understand the words that are filtered. It's not even what you think. I have to filter words like me, the word me gets filtered in a certain situations because they're saying contact me or right. So you, you put words, if you guys don't know what we're talking about, just in case, cause I know you guys probably watch a lot of YouTube, um, in YouTube, you can tell them words. It's uh, it's not phrases, but it's words. And if these words are in someone's comment, it holds that comment until someone releases it, right? And then you can release it. Um, and uh, and I've I have really worked hard uh, to the point of I mean seriously, like I mean I can't say hundreds of hours, but dozens and dozens of hours formulating the right word combinations that have been really problematic for the scam artists to get through. Um, but because of that, some silly things that you guys are typing don't get through. If you look here, I mean, there's a thousand people. I mean, most of the comments are coming through fine, right? It's it's just, like I said, yes, a certain word, or I put a word combination, like, a, you know, these two words together, if these two words come together, everything is always in how they're doing it. And you got to understand, no matter how well I do this, they come up with a new way to do that as well. And a lot of people tell me all kinds of ways that you can do this for the scammers, but this has been highly effective. Okay. Um, I'm lucky to get four or five people a month tell me that they got a scam email. That's the max I'm seeing. That's nothing. I mean, I'm gonna get, I get millions. I'm not exaggerating. I get millions of comments a month across all the platforms and channels. So to see five people say they got, you know, a scammer can reach out to them. Uh, means I'm we're doing something right, but it is a lot of work. It's pretty intense. I do it first thing in the morning. I do it before I go to bed at night. Um, it's why I get to see all the horrible comments. <laughs> and trust me, a lot of times I'm like, oh, screw that guy, all right, I'll prove it. <laughs> but uh, so if it is happening to you, that's what it is happening to. But it shouldn't. It's like I said, it's a weird, um, mostly just like I said, if you want to think about it, just think about what they're asking you and stuff. And if you're phrasing your question or comment like that in any way, right? Like, Hey, Finn, Phil, you should contact me and you can win. <laughs> like that's not getting through <laughs> most likely. So, you know, these are more hard to filter, uh, than the regular comments. So a lot of the stuff isn't being filtered too. So I hope that helps, um, your question. Uh, <laughs> Brighton's talking about his a super chat was from earlier when I was talking about when people could say stop me in public. He's like, he goes, has anyone screeched? Oh my God, it's Phil. No, look, no one is excited to see me. <laughs> They're usually shocked to see me. They're like, you're a real person on the internet here in person. Right. That's really what it is. Um, the, uh, uh, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> hold on, let me refresh this. Um, Uh, so yeah, no, it's, there's no, um, there's no, um, uh, there's no, everybody's excited to see you. I, I actually, uh, Dovey Doss, if you guys know the channel Dovey Doss, he's like 1.7 million subs, super funny guy and awesome. And he's one of the, 
one of the most beautiful people I know on the, you know, that I met through YouTube. There's so many great channels that I met and you tend to, as, as I have done, you tend to put more weight in the nice people you meet that are more famous, right? Like Marty Schwartz or Dovey Das, right? Because you meet them and you go, wow, these seem like normal people. <laughs> and they have a million subscribers. And like, you don't know. And I say that because, not because I have this delusion that people have a million subscribers and they're famous. I've met a lot of YouTubers that just, they're, my wife met a lot of YouTubers now over the years and she'll tell you the same thing. There's a lot of people, man, they're, they are, they're into themselves, man. It's, and I don't, I don't begrudge that. It's just a little weird, right? For me, right? So when you meet people down to earth, it's really cool. Adobe is extremely down to earth. Um, why, why I tell you that is I, I feel bad to this day. I did something to him and I really, really wish I could have took it back. He was talking about people coming up to him because obviously he's got, you know, a million subscribers, almost 2 million. And I said, yeah, don't you love it though? When they come up and say, I, are you, are you? you make videos. And he goes, yeah, they did it to me all the time. And he goes, that he goes, they're great fans. And I go, does that mean they're a fan? Cause they didn't say they like what you did. They just said, you make videos like they're aware of it. And he goes, you're right. <laughs> and then he was bummed. He's like, these people don't even like what I do. They just noticed it. I'm like, yeah, no, no, that's not what I'm saying. Anyways. Um, so what I'm saying to you guys is that what you, you get mostly, if you're on YouTube, you get a lot of people going, Hey, I know you, you make videos. And you're like, yep. <laughs> And then you high five and you go on your ways. Um, but like I said, o overall, it's been great. One thing that's nice is, and then, I don't know, maybe one day it'll change. I doubt it. Uh, I've never met a troll in real life ever. It's funny to me, the amount of people I've met, you know, right? If I was going to say how many comments are rude or trollish or crappy or whatever. And like I said, and I honestly take this to, you know, I take it all with a grain of salt, but also I really believe that half, and I, I think that's actually low, but I'm going to say half of all troll comments are people who think they're funny and they're not, right? Uh, Jerry Seinfeld said, all men think they're comedians and all women think they're uh, uh, interior decorators. Uh, and that joke made me laugh. I don't know why, because I think, I think I'm funny. So <laughs> so anyways, I think a lot of people who say crappy things on the internet, I think they were trying to be funny and it wasn't working. Um, but that all being said, you would think with the amount of people, because it's a lot, you'd meet somebody and they would say horrible things. I've never met anybody said any horrible things. So it tells me they're all, they're all just, they don't got it when it counts, man. They can't say it to you in person. All right. We need to get back to work. Uh, Mr. Biggs, Mr. Biggs, not to be confused with Mr. Big, the band, he's got an extra G and an S. He says, one thing I've wanted is a Fender custom shop strap. I can't believe for the price they won't do stainless steel frets. 3k plus do you think they will ever do them i think you should buy a sir <laughs> that's what i think no uh you know uh, i would say kiesel because i really like kiesel over sir for the price point proposition and stuff but i mean look if you're looking at the price points of custom shop strats and you're not finding the final quality i will tell you this and i tell you this mr biggs uh from from experience of watching it more so than anything i have seen a ton and i mean a ton of players that play sirs they are a lot of them are unhappy Fender Custom Shop owners. It's it's really, <coughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cough. I'm actually really, you can test it yourself. Um, when you see Sir players, when you see a lot of people have Sir, especially the classic series Sirs that are more like a Strat, you're going to find if you talk to them for any length of time, they're going to tell you they have a history of owning a lot of Fender Custom Shop stuff. And uh, John Sir once maybe famously said, I wouldn't have a company if Fender had their act together. Um, and, uh, uh, Ola Strandberg talked about that on the podcast when I did it with him. And, um, my, my point is, is that, uh, I like my Fender custom shop strat. It's right there. No, it's not. <laughs> it's right there. Um, but I will, uh, definitely tell you that I bought two Fender custom shop strats in the couple of year in the last couple of years. And one, and one is okay. And I don't know, you know, I'm not really happy with it. The other one, which is this one is a little better than okay, but ultimately I like them, but I, I would never say they're as good as, you know, a serve. They just have the vibe, you know, it's a, it's a vibe thing. There's, there's track. But if you want stainless steel frets and better quality workmanship for that price point, and you're looking for that guitar, I would check out Grosh, sir. There's a reason why those companies exist. It's just that because a lot of players buy a Fender, you know, everybody does the same thing. Very rarely does somebody just buy a Fender Custom Shop Strat. It's like there's a 
there's a graduation process, right? You get to the Mexican strat and you're like, hey, if I get American standard strat, I'll be even happier. You get the American standard or professional strat. And then you go, oh, if I get deluxe or a vintage reissue, I'll be even happier. And you get that. And then you get the custom shop. And sometimes for some people, it's a perfect, you know, uh, you know, perfect day and they get the amazing guitar and they can't look back. I have friends that equally tell me that they could, after playing custom shop strat, they could never play anything, uh, fin you know, off the rack fender again. This is just too good. Um, but equally so, as I've seen a lot of people who are like, I can't believe for $4,000, this isn't, you know, doing it for me. So I would definitely look at that. Like I said, don't be afraid to start not looking at the vendor logo. Is If that's what matters to you, the quality, the stainless steel frets, all that stuff, just go that, you know, buy the options and the quality from a manufacturer and don't worry about the vendor logo. Buy a Fender t-shirt, buy a Sir, and then our Grosh or an exotic or, and then buy a Fender t-shirt. This is my suggestion. Uh, Mr. S says, hey, you reviewed Fender and PRS tellies. Yep. How about a deep dive or review of a Schechter uh, Nick T-type? I did the, okay. Based on the Johnson Strat, uh, it will be better quality and look better than PRS. Sorry. No, no. I, why are you sorry? <laughs> they um, doesn't, you're not offending me. I don't think you should offend it. You're not offending anybody else either. Um, That's a great idea. Of course. I'm a huge Schecter fan. And for the money, it'll be great guitars. You know, I like doing the Fender stuff. I like doing the the, the PRS stuff. You know, I like doing all the uh, the the, uh, the deep dives. You know, it's very interesting to me uh, what happens. You know, I always wonder like, okay, is this going to do well? Is it not going to do well? You know, how is it going to vibe? You know, are pe how are people going to receive this? Um, the uh, and uh, no, I, I think that's a great suggestion. Thank you for suggesting it. I have no problem doing injectors. I like their their guitars. So and they're not crazy expensive in comparison. So it's not something that's like ridiculous when you buy a you know two three thousand dollar guitar to review on the channel. It's a it's a hard it's a hard pill. You know what I mean? When they're a little bit lower priced, it's a lot easier to do them. Especially if it's a proposition where I buy it and then we sell it, we lose a little money because remember the video makes money and through the affiliate links and all the shenanigans of the you know, views and the Patreon supporters and all that way. And you guys buy merch when you factor it out, sometimes you're in, you know, you're in the black and everything's great. So that's a lot easier. It's a really hard to pull off when in the guitar is expensive. So, because all the guitars lose about the same percentage. I know. And so, so you guys, please don't suggest this to me. Everybody suggests, and they're very kind. They send me emails even, Hey Phil, just let you know. And it's usually Trogly. They're usually, and I like Trogly, but they usually use Trogly's reference. They go, Hey Phil, you talk about how you bought a guitar for a thousand, you sold it for eight. You know, Trogly sells them for more. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. Um, you know, that's in his business model to do that. I have a Patreon base that supports the channel and I get to use those funds to make this content in the way I see fit. So um, that is a luxury to me. So I don't have to worry about re getting every penny of that guitar back. And I kind of like the idea that somebody out there got a guitar and got a good deal. And, you know, like, you know, I, I don't know. I see it all the time. And so, you know, I get, and I get something even better from it. Sometimes I get emails from people saying, Hey, three years ago, you did this video on this guitar and I was the one that bought it and I still have it and I love it and it's great. And thank you for doing that. And I'm like, that's just awesome. Right. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I, you know, you got to make a living. That's just the first thing I got to worry about every day. <laughs> right? Every, like anybody else, how do you make money doing this? And then after that, how can I have a good time and how can I make this, you know, better for the world? How can I make the world a little slightly better place? Maybe. Right. In that order. I mean, unfortunately, that's the order has to come in, but it does come in that way. Um, Mr. S also says it will be better quality than the Fender. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, okay. Yeah, most of the Schecters are uh, consistency-wise. Consistently, they're better quality. Uh, courtesy says, hey, Phil, any chance of a deep dive review on the new Epi Epiphone Alex Lifeson uh, Les Paul? It's a little more obtainable than the original Les, uh, Gibson version. Um, like I said, it had no, no, that wasn't on my radar, but that's how this stuff gets on my radar. You guys mentioned this stuff. You guys talk about it on the podcast and then it gets on the show. Um, and, uh, and, uh, that basically, that's what makes it, that's what makes it get on the show. Right. Cause you guys call it, like I said, you guys, like, like I tell you guys all the time, you guys will mention stuff and I'll do it. And then bam, that video does great. And it really, it's, it makes sense to do it. So, um, uh, Ariella, Ariella, Ariella says, where do you sell your guitars? We sometimes we'll take them to guitar shops that are local. Um, I don't consign them. We just like, if you want to buy them, um, that's sometimes easy for me, especially if, if I've, uh, dropped the ball and sometimes I do, 
we did we wait too long like i have like i have like 10 guitars to sell and i have five amps and three pedals i mean this stuff you know it doesn't i'm not doing a video every day like a lot of channels but i mean still you know if i do one a week that's 52 things a, a year that's accumulating up and very few if you look at very if you look at my channel very few of the things are things that i bought for myself that are specifically for myself and i'm keeping right um i would say think about this like 10 even if it's 20 percent, that would be 10 of things that's 40 things a year that either get sent back to the manufacturers or we we offset it because we either bought it and we're gonna flip it or the, or the manufacturer sent it now we're gonna flip it again turn that money back into the channel um so that's at a minimum that stuff is as goes um if it if we don't get behind we put it on reverb so you know we've been we've been trying to remind ourselves that we need uh sweetwater reached out and basically said if we sell on the gear exchange um they would give us a special deal as because we're a channel and they really need to get eyeballs on the gear exchange thing i did a video where i i tried the gear exchange so i might do that um but so you know i don't think we've sold anything this year uh, direct to consumers and, and, and we have a pile of stuff. It's nuts. It's in the other room right now. It's nuts. There's probably, like I said, 10, 15 guitars, six or seven pedals or five or six pedals, two or three amps. I mean, there's a lot of stuff to offload. Um, and we'll, we'll do that sometimes. Oh, I also see, I know, um, I also, uh, send it to the patrons first. I always let the patrons have first crack at it, but so, you know, majority of the time, you know, they, they pass or maybe one thing gets scooped up by them, but We'll do that first. So. Okay. Um. Okay, hold on a second. All right, so. There was a question. All right, let me do the last super chat real quick. We have two, so we're gonna do these last two. Um, the, the, this one is, hey Phil, love your content. Please share your insights on best speaker or powered speaker cab for modelers. I use a Go uh, Pod Go, mostly play at home, thank you. So I've tried a ton of them. I had the Friedman powered one. It was really good. I had the line six one, which uh, was really good. Um, DV Mark makes a powered speaker. That's ultra light. That's really good as well. Um, I'm trying to think a couple others. I did not try, or at least I don't remember. I think I may have tried briefly the, the Kemper powered speaker. Um, the, uh, for a modeler, I think, believe it or not, my favorite, I think was the line six one. I like the DV Mark because it was ultra light, but I think I like the Line Six one, which was shocking. And I, and I, but I'm not a huge fan of the powered speakers. So you know, I use a Kemper, but I used a powered speaker with a Kemper, and then that's when I got rid of the Kemper and the powered speaker. I now have a powered Kemper, and I use a regular speaker. I do not use any kind of those uh, special speakers on it or anything. I'm using literally my Kemper runs through a cream back. Um, that's how I run it, and I've I figure out a way to make it to where I, that's what made me happy. I've had a couple friends who are huge Kemper, you know, Axe Effects people, and they're like really versed in it way more than I am. And they explain to me why, like, oh, this is why you want this. And I have a tone that I'm super happy with. <laughs> I'm aware of the fact that this tone coming out is slightly off from what it's, I'm recording with, which is fine. I, I'm, I'm able to, I'm happy. And that's the way I've kind of figured it out for myself. I was unhappy until I did that. So, you know, so just be aware of that. Um, Sense of a wheelchair pillow also says, is used going lower and new uh, higher in price? Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what's happening right now. That's an interesting thing, um, which is funny to me because uh, my son just bought a new car and I had to go with him. It took two days and two dealers and it was uh, excruciating, right? As they are. Dealers are, they're fun uh, in a not fun way. Um, so he bought a new car. And, um, what I can tell you that is odd, and that's why I point this out is that the car, Ooh, losing my voice already. <coughs> Excuse me. The car industry is not ha uh, like the guitar industry right now. The car industry used car prices are still climbing and still high, right? I keep hearing the opposite, but, um, we're, we, um, we are selling his old car right now and it is crazy what it's worth. It's worth an insane amount of money, comparatively speaking, um, for what it is. 
and his new car was crazy, right? Everything was crazy. Like it was just a, a assault, a financial assault in every direction. Um, the reason I point that out is it was weird because I would absolutely say the guitar industry is not following that scenario right now at all. It is following the, um, the new car prices are high, but I mean, sorry, new car prices are high, but they're coming down. The new guitar prices are high. They're not coming down. They're just staying there. But of course the dealers are going to get desperate and have to make some discounts and the used prices have definitely come down for sure. Like I said, um, that's why I tell you guys, if you want, just again, just an opinion, um, I would not buy anything used for the price it's stickered out right now. Um, I would definitely reach out or offer something less. People are taking it, no problem. Um, so, so, I mean, that's just, yeah. So, yes, to answer your question, I agree with your uh, statement. Yes, new prices um, are higher, but the used prices are lower, which is why used is a great way to go right now. So, and it's also a great time because, um, and let me tell you, let me tell you what to look for. Cause this is just a, something that recently happened to me too, as well, which is a lot of, uh, dealers are, what they're going to do is start listing new product as used as a way to get around the price. Uh, well, I'm going to call it the price fixing the map. So, um, you, you need to really pay attention because that's always been something in the past that's happened, but it's hap It's going to happen. It's happening now more and it's going to happen a lot more now going forward where all of a sudden you're going to be like, that's weird. This looks brand new. And they're saying it's used, but it's a cheaper price. And that's what they're going to do to bypass that. I recently picked up a guitar for that exact reason. They listed it. I, I was actually watching it. That's how I knew. Well, I mean, sometimes you can just tell because you tell, but I actually was watching the guitar. It was listed as new. It stayed there for months and months and months. And then one day the price went down and they switched it to saying it was used in mint condition. And then I, and if you're a little nervous, uh, you can do what I did, which I emailed them and said, Hey, um, you say it's in mint condition. Is there anything, you know, I should worry about? Um, and they said, uh, it's still in the original box. <laughs> I also bought a, an amp recently, uh, PV6505, many in the same thing. The price was half of what it was normally. They dropped it in half and they had pictures and the pictures were ironically of the box. I thought it was strange. And I said, I said, I, I see it comes with the original box. I go, um, you know, has it been used at all? And he goes, these are still new in box. We have 10. And then I clicked the buy and I bought it. So there you go. Um, Okay, so let's take five, 10 minutes and we'll do the answer Brian's question. Uh, his question earlier was the, about the GX2, the next Badlands, because uh, that comes up and some of the stuff about Badlands. And I thought um, we're going to be doing, um, uh, sharing more about, you know, the next lineup soon and when that's going to happen. As we said, we're waiting. I, I believe the the final, or final Badlands Redline guitars were delivered on Tuesday. I don't think any guitars were delivered past Tuesday of this week. Um, I don't, I'm sure I have access to that because we have a, like a, a community folders and stuff that we can see stuff there. Everybody's pretty transparent what they're doing. Um, hold on, getting some stuff. Wait, uh, okay, okay. I'm just reading some stuff. Okay, let's get back to this. Okay, so, um, uh, so like I said, um, as far as I understand, then uh, the final ones were delivered, and so then, like I said, we have a a period of time we're waiting. We're gonna wait past all the guitars that have been delivered, and then at a certain date, we'll have a meeting, which we plan to have one meeting this Sunday, and discuss the next launch. Like I said, we already have the guitars. So it's about deciding like when the launch happens and what happens. So um, it's a little premature, but I will be happy to talk about it soon. If you guys want to know in the next uh, next week, what did we learn from the first run? And 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 of course, we'll know more as we come, you know, we we come together this Sunday and have our have our meeting. Somebody says I missed a super chat, so I'll grab it before I'm done. But what's interesting is some of the things we learned. Here's what we learned. We learned that um, that 50 guitars was too many guitars for the shop. Um, that's definitely what happened. The shop had hired, uh, three people, right? So think about this because the people who supported the Badlands, uh, venture 
and bought a guitar, three people were given a job. I mean, that's a pretty cool thing to say, man. I bought a guitar and three people now have a job for that. That's a, that's a cool thing, right? Um, and even with ramping up three new people, even with ramping up with everything they did, it was an insane amount of work to do in that period of time. And we're not just going to go, okay, let's do it again. <laughs> right. We, we have, we have long communications with, um, the, the shop and what they need from us and what they need to do. And so going forward, what we do know is they need more time and they need less guitars. And so that's a tough one, man. That's a, so I'm sharing that with you because although that hasn't been decided, what all has been decided, hasn't been decided yet, but that's a piece of information that we learned is that there's a reason why somebody doesn't, there's nobody making that many custom shop guitars in that period of time. It was, uh, it was really, really, really tough to, to do that. Um, because like I said, they are full on custom guitars in every way you can imagine. These are seriously done by hand. There's a ton of, ton of time put in that. So the next line, I think what we're, what we're concerned about that's going to suck is it may not be as many guitars as before, or it definitely might not be more, or we'll have to structure it differently. So yeah. So Brian says it needs to be six months. We, we will know for sure, but yeah, that's my guess. So I'm just going to tell you what I, what I'm going to say, which is, I think it's six months. And so, you know, I think six months, maybe 50 guitars in six months, but it might be 25 guitars in six months. Who knows? You know what I mean? It's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see. Um, we, um, have no interest in degrading or changing anything in the, in the model. So there's no desire to go, well, what if we only do the front of the guitar or what if we only do it this way? Or what if we take away this option? Or what if we downgrade this? Or what if we change that? Or what if we pick this piece of, uh, cause you understand part of the problem is, is that Goto is a premium brand of hardware and it's highly desirable and it's a huge wait time. Every, every shop in the country, I've talked to so many shops across the country and they are all saying the same thing. It takes four to six months to get hardware from Goto. And like I told you, to make the deadline, um, we had to buy Goto bridges at retail. Some of the bridges we couldn't get because we couldn't get all the bridges. So we had to buy them at retail, which is a huge difference from cost to retail, right? And like I said, some had to be disassembled and reassembled because uh, they were slightly off spec from what we wanted. And we could have just sent them with the, the, the new spec, but we wanted everything to be the right way. So, so the reason I share that with you is same thing going forward. Is that going to change? No, we're still going to use the same hardware. We're still going to use everything. We're still going to use everything we wanted because this is, again, we would rather make less uh, and have it the way we want it. We would rather take longer, but have it the way we want it. You know what I mean? So that's that's going to be the rollout on that. Um, and then like I said, and then, um, and then at some point, like I said, I, we, I'm sure we'll have a, a nice, maybe have, like I said, we'll have some, if not all, all the partners of Badlands, we'll have some of the partners on Badlands on the channel if you guys want. And we'll, we'll do a cool little, like, you know, what do we learn from this? What do you know going forward? What's important? You know what I mean? It'll be interesting. I hope that makes, hold on. Yeah. So I'm just reading some comments so you guys know. But other than that, everything's done. Like I already, I've already seen everything. Like I know what the new poster looks like. It's, I actually like it. It's really cool. And then um, the last one I like too, but this one is so off the charts crazy. I actually love it. Um, and then <laughs> uh, let's see. Nelson says, Phil, that why you need to go to hardtail. To hardtail? Well, we have hardtail versions as well. So hardtails and tremolos. Yeah, we have that version and it will stay that way. Just like lefties will be standard. Everything will be standard. So Patrick says, hire another shop. So we actually, I'm actually friends with another shop that actually has more capacity. So, you know, um, but that's, you got to understand. And I've said this before, uh, there's, we started this relationship. This is a crazy thing we did. Um, and then we'll end on this. I know there's a super chat, but I'm going to pin it for next week if that's okay. Um, but when we started this endeavor, it's easy now, right? It's so easy to go, oh, we sold 50 in a minute and we're so like, ah, woo, <laughs> right? Um, and we turned down 40 other orders, right? That's, that sounds, that's great now with hindsight. But in the reality, um, the shop that, that was with us, 
not only did this with us, they, they're not part of us, you know, they're not a partner in this, but they did take a risk with us. Um, and there's going to be loyalty to them for that, for sure. Does it make sense? And you have to understand the growing pains we have is the growing pains they had. That's we're learning that together. We, we, we know eventually we'll be able to make more. Does it make sense? That's not the problem. Like I said, it's not, it's not. And, and by the way, this is not a world domination guitar company concept. This isn't like, well, if we can only make a million, we're not going to make a million guitars. You're right. We already know that never going to be a lot of guitars because there's no way anyone can make a lot of these, the way they're being made. There's just no way. So, um, YouTuber, the guys, the sign on's YouTuber, Phil, have you ever finished a guitar from scratch? Yeah, I've built, well, I've built basses. I've never built a physical guitar from scratch, but I've built many basses before. Not man, many basses, not many like small basses, although I've made a small bass too. Um, so, so like I said, it's, it's a really cool thing. It's really just really like this. We're not trying to create new demand. Uh, we're not trying to create, we know there's demand. We're trying to fill that demand. We're not trying to recreate no new demand. That's why, look, you guys know this could have been easy. I know when we said at the beginning and we'll end on this note, and this will probably maybe be enlightening for you guys. Let's be clear. We could, we, I said in the originally when we started this, we, we, we were hoping to sell 10, right? And maybe we'd sell two. We didn't know. And then we sold 50 and, and then we were like, we were we became very concerned at 50. We talked to the shop and the shop's like, especially at that time, because the shop had a lot of other uh, brands, high-end brands that they were building guitars for too at the time. And they're like, you know, that's a lot of spaces you're asking us to do. Um, and of course they even said, we're going to have to hire some people, but they said, we'll hire those people. We'll make those investments. We'll do this with you guys. Um, that being said, um, uh, I'm trying not to lose my point. What's my point? My point is that being said, when we did this, um, we could have pulled favor. I mean, you know, the Tone King and I are, Tone King is an OG. He's been doing YouTube since 2008. That's longer than, it's like him and Chapman. And like I said, and, and, um, uh, Scott Grove, you know what I mean? I mean, these guys like literally built this platform that we all use now, um, for the most part, right? These guys are the guys that out there started doing content. Um, I say that because he's literally friends with like everybody, you know, he's, he's a nice guy. He's well, well respected and liked, uh, in the, in, in the YouTube community and he's friends with everybody. Then you look at me and you guys know, I mean, I, my list of friends on YouTube is pretty, pretty extensive. There's a lot of channels. And so you can imagine we could have just sent guitars or a guitar to all our friends on YouTube and be like, and blast you guys. But part of the early discussion was we weren't trying to create a new market. We were trying to fill a gap in a market, even that, though that gap isn't very big and there's not a lot of money to be made from that gap. We can do it because none of us need this business to be our only business. We have other endeavors, other livelihoods. And it was like, and like I said, it started with simple as wouldn't this be cool if we just made these guitars for ourselves. And then we're like, let's share them with everybody else. So that's the idea. And that's literally not going to change for a long time, you know? So what I'm saying is, is that although we want to fill the demand, we're not going to literally try to create more than what there is. So that's, that's what that is. And that's what we learned. We learned that it was a tough thing to do. It was tough. So, okay. On that note, I think we'll call it. That was a long show. Uh, as always, guys, I want to tell you, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate you guys. Um, we'll have the show next week. Um, I will give you guys an update next week. Like I said, uh, if you guys are curious about what, like I said, the final assessment of the first run and how we felt it went and what we're going to do for the next run. Uh, for those who are curious, I guess the original question is when is the next run going to come? It's We think it's August. So, you know, uh, that's the goal. So we'll say that August is the release. So there you go. For those that are curious. All right. As always, guys, I want to thank you so much for your time and hanging out and being guitar freaks. And now go play guitar and have fun. Enjoy your weekend. And we'll